fought for the Ashes competition between the UK and Australia. We call it the Ash series because it's Australian sensible hours for us in Australia. But as is one pointed out to me from the people from the Western part of the country, it's still six in the morning there for them. But it's a good time and I welcome you all back to the first session of 2021. Uh, we've got a really good series of programs coming up this year. We've got a lot of different presenters uh, that are coming up. We're gonna have a few familiar faces back. So stay tuned and uh, we'll be publishing them out an agenda here uh, once I get it confirmed. I'd like to acknowledge Mark Hart up in the top left-hand corner of my screen. Anyway, Mark does all of our technical recording, posting of the videos and all that other kind of stuff. You can see his big hand waving. As you can tell, he's got the technical know-how to do all that kind of stuff. I don't. Um, but he posts all the videos, all the training sessions, and all the material on the OC Callers website, which are available to watch free or to download some of the material as well. So thank you once again, Mark, for everything. Uh, we have done the topic of the Sicilian Circle on a couple of different occasions now, and it's a topic that comes up very, very frequently. And it's also one that during the Christmas holiday, I got about 30 different emails about the Sicilian Circle, but not how it works, but how can you make the best use of it in club and in class level for teaching or for using. So I'm not going to go into great, great details of choreography on the Sicilian Circle. What I'm going to do is actually talk about applying it and how to perhaps make the most out of that aspect. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, as always, uh, if, if you do have a comment or something that you want to interject in the presentation, by all means, feel free. But if you could just mute yourself, and that way, uh, any background noise, or if you want to have a side conversation, it's not going to interfere with the presentation. So let me just get this up here. It's the wrong folder, of course. There, there. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is using the Sicilian circle at club and at class level. Now, as I said, there's been a lot of questions regarding the use of the Sicilian circle, especially at class level, not so much at club level, but at class level, as opposed to using squares or facing couples for teaching and reviewing. Um, the truth is, squares are great tools. Facing couples are great tools for teaching and dancing. Um, the Sicilian circle is great for maximizing participation. And all of these techniques, squares, tools, lines, circles, are just that, tools to aid you in learning, especially at the class level, at the new dancer level. But you can carry those on into class. So let's start right at the beginning. When we think of square dancing, the presentation and the perception is four couples arranged in a square that follow the prompts of the caller. That's your basic definition. And the dancers, they can work individually as a couple. They can work in groups of three, four, five, six, seven dancers, right up to eight dancers to perform whatever the movement that is required as that has been called. Most square dancing, however, is, and I cannot stress this enough, it's been said by almost every caller at every presentation, most square dancing is one couple working together or generally two couple dancing. And most of the complex movements in square dancing are performed with just two couples. Dancing in formations other than the standard four couple square used to be, and in many places it still is, common practice at square dance. Okay. The most frequently used ones we have are large circle formations. Everybody get up, make a big circle, and we'll do a mixer. Uh, we've got concentric circles where you've got an inside circle and an outside circle. We've got gendered lines, all the boys on one side, all the girls on the other side. Or we've got coupled lines, you know, partners up one side, matching partners on the opposite side. We've got the Sicilian circle, which is couples facing each other around a circle around the outside of the floor. You've got hexagons, you've got rectangles, you've got triangles, you've got squares, and basically whatever a caller can think of. The most practical, in my opinion, of all these activities and alternate formations is, of course, however, the Sicilian circle. Okay. It's essentially a big circle comprised of facing couples of four, just like in the graphic here, 
in this graphic, there's eight pairs of facing couples. That number can be as small as five and as large as you have room for. And you can even put one circle inside of another circle if you want, if you've got the room in the hall and you've got the number of dancers. The beauty is odd numbers or even numbers don't really matter. Okay, and we'll, we'll come to that in a bit. The principle of it is simply two couple dancing. You're gonna use all your known movements and all the simple techniques of passing and moving past the original facing couple to meet another couple coming from the opposite direction. That's essentially it. The red couples, as an indicator, are going to go one way. The green couples are going to go the other way. And all you really have to learn is two couple dancing and the ability to pass through and move to the next in a number of different ways. That's it. Now, a Sicilian circle has a number of significant advantages. We're going to start by looking at the dancer advantages. One of the biggest advantages is that anyone, well, actually almost everyone dances all the time. And that's regardless of the number of dancers you have. Only one dancer would be required to sit out rather than if you were working in squares, you could have up to seven dancers sitting out. Okay, no one has to sit out unless you're an odd single dancer. Okay, all couples are on the floor during teach, they can be. Odd number of couples no longer have to wait for a fourth or another couple to join in order to join the dance. As you notice this uh, couple with the red box against it, that's an odd number of couples. They just join the circle, pick a direction. Somebody will come to them in a few moves and you'll just have an odd couple standing for a very short sequence. And then it's passed through move to the next and you've got a new person standing. They can watch what the others do. Uh, starting a class or starting a night in a Sicilian circle, which is what I like to do, it allows everybody to join in, and it's a great place for doing a review, a confirmation. It's a great place for social interaction. It's a great place for warm up. And even if they come in late, they can still join the circle. One of the big advantages is clique busting. Sicilian circles will level the playing field because couples and sometimes individual dancers are constantly mixing. And this virtually eliminates the, possible, uh, the possibility of weaker dancers being coupled with weaker dancers throughout an entire dance. You can also use it as a real mixer by changing the individual partners in the group of four and then pass through moving to the next. This separates troublesome partners or in some cases troublesome partners where he's trying to dance his wife's dance or where she's trying to dance her husband's dance or partner's dance and all that other kind of stuff. It's a great way of mixing it up with nobody being selected or isolated out because everybody's in the same boat. It's a great way to quickly change couple pairings if there is a problem by having facing couples pass through and move to the next um, to form another set of four, you can mix and match dancer skills. If you need to move a weaker dancer or a weaker couple to a stronger couple, do three pass-throughs in a row and get them set right at the beginning. There's a lot of techniques to do that. The third one, dancers learn the, the square dance movements and they learn the individual couple formation mechanics as couples. Two couples working together is less confusing to dancers than four couples working in a square. It's a lot easier to do square through with two couples than it is to do square through. Now square through again. Now you've got two groups of four doing the square through. In the Sicilian circle, they're a bit more spread out. They can learn the formation and the mechanics of that two couple movement as two couples without having to worry about what the rest of the square is doing and without having to look or watch the rest of the square. One of the biggest things is about 80% of the calls at basic and mainstream are commonly done as two couple movements. However, the reality is with a little work and a little bit of practice, 92% of the basic and mainstream calls, that's 63 out of the 68 movements can be done with two couples in a Sicilian circle. Uh, the exceptions are grand square, Ferris wheel, although that can be played with, eight chain four, trade by, and spin chain through. There are variations of some calls like split circulate, four ladies chain, all eight circulate, and all those other kinds of things. Um, they can be done and modified, but you, you basically, you're not calling them. You're, you're changing the parameters of those, okay? And Sicilian circles provide another form of variety in square dancing. And quite frankly, they're just plain fun to dance in. The advantages for callers, 
teaching and reviewing any facing couple square dance basic in a Sicilian circle isolates the action to just the four dancers. That takes away all the distraction from any other dancers as seen from the square formation. It also allows you to watch each group of four individually without having to match the square. And if you see everybody flowing in somebody's thoughts, it will stand out to you very quickly. You haven't broken anybody down because you can just call, pass through, move to the next. They'll grab a partner and move to the next couple and you can carry on and look at it. Teaching with demonstrations is also easier as everyone can see a demonstration couple in the center of the circle. If you have squares all over the floor and you wanna get a demonstration couple where everybody can see, you basically have to move all the squares out from the middle or you have to have everybody sitting down and you get up and you demonstrate it while everybody's sitting down. With a Sicilian circle, you can actually walk them through step-by-step step with your demonstration if, you, if you're inclined to do that. Or you can have a couple come in the middle or two couples come in the middle, I should say, and you can demonstrate. Everybody can see it without having to change anything and you can go right into the next, next part of, of using that movement. It allows the caller to easily see what's happening on the entire dance floor and it is much easier to manage groups of four, uh, groups of four dancers than it is to manage multiple squares. Four, there's very little standing or watching while others dance. Two couple dancing has everyone moving at the same time. Odd couples, it's a simple pass through change. And now we've got new people participating and a new couple standing. A short routine makes this happen very, very quickly. Most important, it is a great way for the newer caller to learn control of the movement of the dancers. And as you progress using it, even to learn resolution techniques with two couples. It's a great way to drill on timing. It's a great way to drill on focus movements. It's a great way to practice two couple isolated sites. Uh, it's a great way to practice formation management with two couples. It's a great way to observe body flow and mechanics. It's two couple dancing, but with a purpose and everybody's participating. I tried to find disadvantages of, disadvantages of the Sicilian circle. I did find one. There's a tendency to take advantage of success for too long. A Sicilian circle is too easy to use. It's fun for the dancers to dance in. It makes them feel successful. <clears throat> Even if they have a bad short routine, they pass through and move to the next. They've got a good routine. They feel successful. It's social because they're interacting with everybody. Because of all those positives, it's very easy for callers to lose track of the time because you're just flushed with success and the fun of it. You've got to really focus yourself to adhere to a tip length to try and keep it the same as a normal square dance tip or a square dance bracket. 10 minutes of activity nonstop is a lot of dance action. So be very, very mindful of your dancers. Okay, Don't just keep going because they're all getting it. Give them that break. The last thing you want to do is wear them out in an opening and they're exhausted for the rest of the evening. So let's look a little bit at practical management. There's only a couple of simple guidelines for Sicilian circles as far as practical teaching, dan or dancing, and management tool, or as a management tool for square dancing. The name itself refers only to the shape of the formation and not the actual Sicilian circle dances. There are traditional Sicilian circle dances. That's not what we're talking about. Okay? Uh, you've got to remember, it's not a replacement for square dancing. It's just another tool in your caller toolbox to make your calling, your teaching, and your dancer social activity more effective. When you're going to use it, you've got to educate your dancers on how to join an active circle. If you come in as a couple or grab a couple, pop in, pick a direction, and wait. If there's a couple already standing with nobody there, go over to that side of the square because even if you do get a pass through and move to the next, the next couple will be in that general area. Use it frequently and make it part of your nightly club or your nightly class opening and teaching sessions. If you start doing that, your dancers are gonna start anticipating it. Dancers that may be having a little trouble and feeling a bit, oh, I'm not quite so sure, that need a little bit of review or extra help will start showing up early. And you can even start these things a little bit early for your review sessions to get them in there. They don't feel pressure. They don't feel, oh, I gotta make a square. I've got seven, you know, three other couples or seven other dancers coming in just because I need review. 
they're there, they're having fun, but they're also learning and reaffirming and making it more positive. As a caller, you've got to think of it as a looped eight chain through formation. Okay, it's just a couple stack up on each other. So same as if you do a head square through, you're in that eight chain through formation. That's what a Sicilian circle is. Pass through, move to the next. Well, you move to the next, you've got the center spacing. The outsides would just do a partner trade. They steal that from the progressive squares, but it's the same principle. If you think of it as a looped eight chain through formation, and remember you can't do an eight chain through, all your dancing is there. There's very, very little changes that you have to make. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. Think insides and outsides, okay? In a Sicilian circle, you've got one group going one way, you've got the other group going the other way. So if I've got two facing couples and I call star through, think inside couples and outside couples, where the centers of the circle are the insides and the ones nearest the wall are the outsides. That will expand your choreography for things like insides arch, dive through. Now we're in a tandem. You have leaders peel off. Now we're in an inverted line. Crossfire, we're back to facing whatever. You can do a lot of material if you just change your mindset and you do your insides, outsides when you do those individual stranger little movements. Okay. Singing calls, 64 beat phrases and resolutions. You can learn to resolve. You can learn and practice a lot of techniques like isolated psych, but singing calls and the 64 beat phrasing and the resolutions, and you've got to get everybody back with your partner and all that other kind of stuff. You can, but it doesn't apply and nobody misses it. You can actually practice the resolution techniques on a two by four grid in the Sicilian circle, but you really don't have to. You're there to confirm the actual movements and give the dancers a social interaction. Presently, the standard practice is to move from uh, the square formation to an eight chain through formation, head square through, we're there, and run the dancers back and forth across that two by four grid. That's essentially what I was talking about with two couples stacked. Moving to a Sicilian circle, just includes more facing couple sets in the stack. It's just a longer stack, that's all it is. And it's in a continuous loop, so it doesn't actually come to the end. The primary dance routines you're gonna use with facing couples are facing couple zeros. You know, And that's if you wanna keep your partners, you call a little bit of isolated sight, you've got a facing couple zero. If you've got facing couple zeros already set up for your feature move like spin the top, swing through, spin the top, slide through, that's a facing couple zero. Pass through, move to the next, do it again. You can do all sorts of things and you'll find that you're able to develop zero modules very, very quickly. At the end of any one of those zero modules, everyone's in the same geographical position where they started and they can move to the next. You can decide if you wanna do a partner change and separate dancers. You can decide if you wanna keep them together. If a caller decides not to call a facing zero, then the progression is a big mixer. That's also a very social aspect and it's a lot of fun. And as the couples progress to other couples, well, they get to dance with many more dancers and that can all be done in the same square formation. Everything you do in a Sicilian circle, you can do in a square formation. Again, it's up to the caller to decide to where they want or if they want to return everybody back to their original setup if they want to return them back to the original set of four, or if they just want to end it with an all mixed. I personally, I some, I like to leave them mixed at the end. Um, sometimes I'll leave them mixed. I'll do a short Sicilian circle, leave them mixed, and then I'll just promenade them into squares if I've got the right number of dancers and just end with a quick singing call. If I don't have an even number for squares, I won't do a singing call. I'll just keep them going and I'll end up in a big circle and end with a big right and left grand movement or something like that. As with most of what I've done with the modules, I keep the facing couple zeros short. You've got to keep these dances in new couple, mix them around, pass through, move to the next, keep your sequences short and progress to the new couples frequency, uh, frequently. Why is that not changing? Now, progression in a Sicilian circle. This is a big thing for newer callers and experienced callers to look at. There's many, many ways to progress. And the most obvious is 
pass through, move to the next, okay? Ideally, you wanna get your progression until you're really, really, really comfortable in moving and mixing dancers. Standard couple, pass through, move to the next. Now, when I say pass through, move to the next, that's any kind of equivalent. Square through three, move to the next. You're going the opposite direction. Veer to the left, veer to the right, move to the next. Do a right and left through with a full turn, move to the next. Dance actions like that can change the direction instead of all progressing one way, you're progressing different ways. And it gives a whole new feel to the floor. Let them feel the impact of leaving that group of dancers behind them and moving forward to someone new. You're not doing, um, the reason you do that is you let them understand the concept that they're not doing anything else until the caller calls it. That's a really, really good habit to develop. And that's why a Sicilian circle is really good for developing these habits. If I'm working with a couple and I go uh, swing through, spin the top, slide through, do a do side do, go once and a half, move to the next. They're not going to automatically anticipate doing the next call. They know they move to a new couple, they're facing, and they wait for the caller to call the next move. When they get back in squares, if they're used to doing square through, there's a new couple, they're gonna anticipate listening for the next call. What am I supposed to do with the next couple instead of automatically jumping into something? That's a very important skill for them to lead or to, to learn. Um, once your dancers have the idea of progression in Sicilian circles, there's, there's a lot of ways uh, to progress. Veer left, veer right, or vice versa, if you're willing to teach it. You can do veer left, veer right, veer right, veer left, and you know do it like a couple's weave the ring. It's a great progression tool. Swing through, boys run. Now we're in two-face line. You can do a couple circulate to the next couple. You know, So you've got an inside couple circulating and an outside couple circulating in different directions. And you know, you bend the line, you can wheel and deal, whatever you want to do. You can do pass the ocean, slide through, right and left through and a half sachet, star through, move to the next. There's a whole myriad of options available to you. And if you're really willing, you can even do stars, you know, make a right hand star from an inside outside. Turn it three quarters, move to the next. Boys are leading, make a left hand star, however you want to do it. There's a whole sequence of things that. Uh, you know, those used to be in traditional square dancing, um, uh, star, uh, star, star circle or something like that, I think it was called. Okay. So there's a lot of progression techniques available to you. It's not always pass through and they are not boring unless you make it boring. So when we look at these principles, work the dancers progressively with pass through, move to the next flow sequences. Make use of short two couple zeros. These are the ones that keep the partners. Take advantage of short mix and move on sequences. Those are partner change sequences. Have the odd couple out, pick a direction and wait for an oncoming couple. Alternatively, if in long lines, teach them that if you're on the end of the line facing a wall, do a partner trade and wait. That's exact, that's taken right from progressive squares but it's the same principle. It's the same principle in old contra dancing. If you get to the end of the line and everybody's working in couples, just do a partner trade and wait, they'll come to you. Uh, and be aware of when you can end. Watch that time, 10 to 15 minutes maximum. 10 minutes of dancing, 15 minutes maximum, and that's if you're teaching. That includes all the teaching time, all the walkthrough. You never wanna go more than 15 minutes people dancing on the floor in a big circle type movement and with a right and left grand and have everybody, you know, get everybody out, you know, bend the line or veer to the left and whatever you want. Sw Alaman left, swing everybody into a big circle, join hands, circle left, Alaman left, right and left grand, say hi to everybody as you go by, swing your partner, promenade, find your chair, well done, give yourselves a hand, all of that kind of stuff. And always on a positive note. Now, I did say earlier, be aware of what you cannot do. As we said, about 80%, a little bit more than 80% of the calls at basic and mainstream are common two-couple calls. 
with a little bit of work and practice, 92%, 63 out of 68 of the basic and mainstream program are two couple calls and can all be done with a Sicilian circle. The, the five that I've got listed there are the ones that you cannot do. Although Ferris wheel can be introduced with the oncoming couple as an idea. Um, eight chain four, no, you can do an eight chain one, but why would you? I would avoid it completely. Trade by, the concept can be done, but it's another one I would avoid completely. And spin chain through, although the flow can be introduced, uh, working with an oncoming couple, it's another one I would avoid completely. You know, it's five movements that you can teach in a square. That's really all you need. Okay. Uh, other, other movements like the variations, uh, you can do a split, but separate around one only. If you do a separate around two, you, you end up starting to confuse people. Four ladies chain, you can't do a four ladies chain, nor can you do a chain three quarters. All eight circulate, no. You can do a circulate insides if you get them all into waves and you can have the inside circle and the outside circulate and all the centers circulate to the next couple. But again, why would you? You don't really need to. Um, and split circulate, you don't do a split circulate. Use a box circulate. That's really it. Okay. Uh, there are other calls that you can use, but they require callers to think a little bit, like circle to a line. This is where I was saying, get your inside couple, your outside couple. If you do from your facing couples along the Sicilian circle, star through. Okay, then you can do circle to a line halfway around. Original outside man, break, make a line. You're all facing in, good. And then you can work from there. You can do a dive through from there, incise arch, dive through. Uh, you can do an Alamo style, but it's really, really tight. And again, why would you? You're all do, already doing it in waves. You can do a double pass through, but you're varied to a single track. Double pass through doesn't mean there's two people passing two people. It means you're passing two people going the same way you are. First couple go left, next couple go right. You can do that in tandems. You can also do it with individual dancers. First answer, go left, next answer, go right. There's lots of variations. It, where it comes down to is the amount of work you want to put into it is how successful you're going to be, just like calling square dance. So the success tips, keep it, your sequences short and simple. Progress quickly and frequently to a new couple. Vary your progression movements and your progression methods. Veer left, veer right, move to the next. Square through three, move to the next. Pass through, move to the next, use it. Spin the top, turn through, move to the next. All these kinds of things. Use circles and stars. Give yourself lots of direction changes. One of the, the warning things of two couple isolated site is often overflow. The same principle applies here. You've got to ensure that you get good direction changes. A right and left through is a good direction change. You know, instead of touch a quarter, boys run, left touch a quarter, girls run. Does the same thing, but you got that direction change. It feels good for the dancers. Use half sashayed setups for progression transition. You know, right and left through and a half sashay. Star through, move to the next. You know, that's from an inside outside. You can do these kinds of things and they get used to working half sashayed. You can do things like individual progressions, um, do a half sachet once and a half, do a double pass through, face right, chain down the line, half sachet, slide through, move to, you know, all sorts of different things. How you progress and the complexity, the simplicity or the simple complexity is entirely up to you. You're the caller that has to read your dancers on the floor. The nice thing about this is when you start right from very beginning, you can start in a Sicilian circle. You, you may only have 10 movements under the dancer's belt. You can do that in a Sicilian circle and you can give them a lot of variety, a lot of interaction and a lot of fun. What happens when you only have a small number of dancers? That's a big question, especially today on the way our clubs are set up and the way our dancers are set up. If you short dancers, the principles of a Sicilian circle can still be used by stealing the ideas, as I said, from 
couple on the outside, or sorry, the couple on the end facing out, do a partner trade. All you do is you just do it in a line. You stack your facing couples and you have an odd couple out. When they get to the end and they're not facing another couple, have them do a partner trade. Make sure your progression is not half sachet. That's the only thing you have to make sure of if you're going to do that progression in lines. You know, I'm trying really hard not to sneeze here. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is, is if we look at this sequence on the screen that we've got here, okay, the first sequence is the longest. It's also the simplest. It allows the dancers to identify two couple dancing before they move to the next. So we've got our Sicilian circle and we call do the right and left through. Veer to the left. Girls cross run. Bend the line. Square through three. Do a partner trade. Star through. California twirl. Flutter wheel. Reverse flutter wheel. Veer to the left. Veer to the right. I've done a lot of, you know, wow, there's really interesting stuff there. And move to the next. Once I get to that move to the next, I'm with new people. Now I'm going to make my sequences short. The nice thing about the Sicilian circle, you can always use a do si do almost at any time to fix it and standardize the dancers to allow the dancers to adjust. Short sequences work very, very well. Progression works very well. And you know, this, this sequence here actually goes very, very quickly. It only takes about, you know, 10 minutes to finish. And I could repeat this. I, I would have progressed them through everybody on the floor probably about four or five times. So I'm just going to flip over to Taminations and show you what I mean here. So let me stop share. And then I've got to reshare and go to Taminations. Okay, so what I've done is I've just taken this sequence and I've done it with a square. So I'm just going to set it up here. Okay, so the principle of this, just picture this as a sequence of dancers or couples stacked in a Sicilian circle. Uh, I've got, you notice over here on the left, I've got a, in brackets, progression movement. I've got move to the next. If there's an odd couple, that's where I say outsides trade. Although I typed in outsides trade in Tamination just to show you what they would do, that would be an automatic thing. That would not be part of the sequence. But just picture this as a big circle going around the floor. Okay, so we've got a right and left through, veer to the left, girls cross run, bend the line, square through three, do a partner trade, star through, California twirl, flutter wheel. Now, this looks tight in a square, but they're spread out in a big circle. Reverse flutter wheel. Now I'm going to do a progression. Veer to the left, veer to the right. I've moved to the next, the outside couple automatically trades. You know, or if I have it, everybody, all the couples would be doing what the center couple is doing. Right and left through and a quarter more. Veer to the right, move to the next. Now I'm working again with a new set of couples. And I've done, you know, partner change stuff. Spin the top. Brings me here, turn through, great. Star through, move to the next. I'm outside couple are doing an automatic. Recycle, sweep a quarter more, pass through. Okay, now I did a center star through, but that would be a star through. Outside would automatically do it. And what the center couple is doing is what all the couples would be doing. There's another transition, moving to the next. Boys run, bend the line. Star through. Right and left through. Oh, didn't see that. Should not call a right and left through after a star through. You can, but. Veer to the left, there's a transition. And you just keep going in your sequences for about 10 minutes or so. Great, everybody's done. Come back, do the right and left grand, and all promenade to find a chair, take a well-deserved break. Everybody's happy, they're all hooting and hollering, and they all feel good. They can go get a drink and talk about what a good dance they do. Oh, wow, I got to remember all the stuff that we learned last week and I didn't have any problem with it. Well, I did have a problem, but the caller didn't see that because we moved to the next couple so quickly, but I got it the second time. I feel good about myself. And that's what the power in a Sicilian circle is. 
So when you're looking at these kinds of things, these are tools that you can use as a caller to help your dancers review, refresh, learn, dance, socialize, have fun, feel good about themselves and feel flush with success. And you as a caller get all those same benefits as well as being able to identify any trouble spots or any problems that any particular dancer might have because they will stand out very, very quickly. Now, the use of these circles is not a new concept. They've been around for over a century at square dances and at social dances. We've just forgotten how to use them and how fun they can be. This little ditty that we've got here in the middle is I think 1951 or 1948 or something like that. That was where that was taken from. And it was a common thing. This is what you would get. All the couples bound, swing, eight step around, go around the ring. Everything was geared on the eight beat phrase. But essentially, this is just a Sicilian circle, moving one to the next, everybody socializing in a dance. Why don't we do that anymore? We've looked at this before in another session, so I'll go through it very quickly. But this was from a 2016 festival of hot hash calling in the US. Okay. Now, you notice I've highlighted the move trade by. If I change trade by to move to the next, everything there can be done in Sicilian circle, except the right and left grand. And yeah, you're home. But I could easily change that slide through, swing, join hands, make a big circle, a la man left, everybody right and left grand all the way around, swing your partner, promenade, take a break. Mel, I don't think you're projecting. You can't hear me? I can hear you. Sharing. I can hear you, but I can't see your screen. Yeah. You're not I'm... sharing very well, Mel. No, you're not sharing your screen at the moment. Try that again. Is that working? That worked. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that works. Okay. This this was the an old old dance. I think it was from the either late forties, early fifties, part of a square dance, but it is essentially just a Sicilian circle. It was a big everybody get up, have fun in the social circle. It was very common. This is the thing uh, I was talking about. This is from a, a hot hash transcript of a festival in the US in 2016. Okay. With the exception of the three trade buys in that sequence, if I change the word trade buy to move to the next, everything there except right here at the end where it says Alaman left, right, and left grand, can be done in the Sicilian circle. Every little bit of that. This is one from Adelaide in 2018. Okay, Again, trade by. Everything there can be done in a Sicilian circle with the exception of trade by. I change that to move to the next. And I change here, split circulate. I change that to a box circulate. And everything in there can be done in a Sicilian circle. There's a very, very good caller online here with us. That's Daryl. He's somewhere in there. I don't know where he's at right now. But he is a very, very strong proponent and has said almost all square dancing is two couple calling. Almost everything you do is two couple calling. Once you realize that as a caller, you're going to find your calling is going to get easier. And using the Sicilian circle is a great tool for learning that, learning your two couple choreographic management and learning your two couple flow management. It is a great, fantastic tool. And it's an easy tool for the dancers to learn and enjoy. One of the big things you're gonna use is facing couple zeros, short facing couple zeros, not square zeros, but two couple zeros. You know, square through three, boys run, girls run, square through three, boys run, girls run. There's a nice two couple zero. And it, it feels strange. In a square, that would feel weird. In a Sicilian circle, that's, oh my God, that's hilarious. Right and left through, flutter wheel, veer left, chain down the line, flutter wheel, veer left, chain down the line. There's a two couple zero. Pass through, move to the next. They're short, they're sweet. You can pick any two couple zero that you can think of and you can apply it. 
um, one of the classic singing calls on Royal Record. Head square through, and then it goes swing through, boys run, bend the line, right and left through, flutter wheel, slide through. It's a two couple zero. Fits perfect into a Sicilian circle, pass through, move to the next. This is the other thing, innovation. This is where callers have to do their work in squares. Callers have to do their work when they're programming. Callers have to do work when they're teaching and learning movements. A Sicilian circle is no different. You've got a lot of material there, but you have to actually do work. Remember I said you had to think inside couple and outside couples. If you do get your Sicilian circle and call a star true, go up to the middle and back. You now have an inside couple and an outside couple. Pass through, outside couple trade. Now we have everybody facing into the center. You could have the girls face in, just the boys, cloverly. I've got one boy following another boy and they're gonna come in between two girls. Split the girls. First boy go left, next boy go right. Around one to a line. Tag the line. Girls, do you turn back? Star truck, I'm there. I'm sorry, girls, do you turn back? Do a do side do, I should say. Step to a wave. Boys run, I'm back to facing couples. In, I'm ready to do a pass through. I'm sorry, I start through, pass through, move to the next. You have to actually learn those little bits of techniques, but you know, those are examples. They'll be in the handout as well, but they're great for two couple calling. For those of you that have been doing um, the two couple Zoom sessions, or the virtual Zoom sessions, there has been phenomenal examples of two couple material dancing, where there's a lot of this innovative stuff being done. You know, outside couple, do you turn back? Trailers in, cast off three quarters. Wow, where did that come from? The nearest couple, pass through with the other, cast off three quarters, center straight, ends fold. Bang, we're back to that zero. I'm dancing individual dancers in the line, but I'm still doing two couple stuff. I'm able to use movements like tag the line, all that other stuff. I'll be right with Question you. Question mail. Yeah, okay. I'll be right with you in a second. So the work and everything else that is being done is up to you. But if you're not ready to do that, you know, there's parts of that you may want to leave that for the square. If you're a brand new caller and you're not comfortable with circle to a line or tag the lines or setting up the individual stuff, then don't. You don't have to do all that. It's just more stuff you can use. As I said, 80% of most calls you normally do can be done in a Sicilian circle. Leave that other 20% for the square if that's where your comfort level is. But what you want to do is you want to make sure your dancers are comfortable, having fun, having a good time, and not overtaxed. All right, I saw my chat bar floating up an awful lot. But uh, Bob, you had a question, so I'm going to get you to ask your question. Okay. In a Sicilian circle, who's the near couple? Okay, when you're... <laughs> you got to think insides and outsides. I do that, yeah, but I don't see how that translates to near and far couple. Yep, and I just caught that one myself. I'm so glad you asked that one. That was taken from a two couple zero based on the position of the caller. So I said, think insides and outsides. I copied that from a virtual square dance and I didn't change it. The near okay. couple would be the inside couple. The far couple would be the outside. Okay, couple. so we won't use the terminology, change. right? <laughs> yep, so in okay. fact, what I'm going to do Uh, and thank you for catching that because I missed it completely. Where are we here? Uh, the so if we do the outside couple, do you turn back? Trailers in, cast off three quarters. Okay, so that would be inside to pass through. Okay, instead of near couple. Those are two dancers on the inside. Okay. 
Um, I can live with that, Mel. <laughs> no, that's an excellent catch. And it's now been corrected. Uh, now, um, stop share. I just want to have it. Mark, with, are you still with us, Mark? No, he's gone. Okay, so I just got to have a quick look through the chat to see if there's any questions. So let me just, how do I do that? What do you mean with inside couple pass through? No, the near two, the near two dances, not the inside couple, the near two. So if, if I, for instance, if I have the, um, you know, I'm working in a group of four and we've got an inside couple and an outside couple. If I say star through, I now have one couple going one direction, one couple going the other direction. I would say the inside two, those are the two dancers that are facing on the inside of that circle. Just those two dancers pass through and they step through one's in a right hand anyway, one's in a left hand anyway. Cast off three quarter, takes me to an inverted line. So like I said, you can be innovative, but you don't have to stretch. It depends, you have to be able to read the dancers, you have to be able to read the floor. You have to be able to look at all of these things and say, right, what can my dancers do? What can I do? The only limitation in the Sicilian circle are the five movements that the choreography prohibits and your ability to manage that floor. And if you're not comfortable doing circle to a line, original outside break, mm -hmm. then don't do it. Wait until you get into squares. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do a lot of stuff without having to use that material. Mel, um, can, you, Mel can you hear me? Yes, I can. This is Bob Riggs from Denver, uh, just wanted to comment on that. Sometimes if you're in the Sicilian circle formation, not the inside outside formation, you need to be able to identify the clockwise and the counterclockwise couples. And that's typically done by numbering ones and twos with the ones having their left shoulder toward the center of the room and the twos having their right shoulder toward the center of the room yep. so that they get to understand that. So. If you're not dealing with inside outsides, you're dealing with clockwise and counterclockwise, the dancers very easily understand numbers in that context and can be used to clearly do choreography that way. Yep. I, I, what I try, I look at using one and two in the clockwise, counterclockwise, the same as I look at uh, original heads, original sides. It's something for the dancers to remember and I, I, I started doing them like that and I always kept the progression like that, ones and twos, but I stopped doing it because I found that for me, the most power in the Sicilian circle, and I can guarantee, I, I'd like to see any caller that has never had dancers in their classes that were not particularly troublesome or particularly difficult or just didn't get it, that you had to split that couple up or split those dancers up to mix and match. I've never had that luck. So if you've had that luck, you're very, very blessed indeed. And if I always get that ones and twos, they have to change. Am I a one now or am I a two now? I, I stopped using that, but you're absolutely right. You have to get them into the mindset of clockwise and counterclockwise. And that's why I said at the beginning, once you've got that, you've got your counterclockwise and clockwise progression, use a star through insides and outsides. That's really as far as I go, so that they know who's the inside dancers, inside couples, or who's the outside dancers or the outside couples. The progression becomes a natural function. But it, it just does take a while. Okay, I'm just go going through the chat to see if there's any questions here first. Um, okay, uh, one circulates are always to the next position and not to the next person or couple. This is why I was saying when you do things like circulates, if you're going to do a circulate in your group of four, you know, touch a quarter box circulate or touch a quarter circulate, you're doing that in your group of four. If you do a insides and outsides facing couple, do a do side do circulate, you'd have the end straight and the center straight. When you're doing a Sicilian circle, if you want them to get the idea of circulating to the next group of dancers, You've got to go insides, circulate forward to the next, or outsides or the ends, circulate to the next group of four. 
you've got to be specific on that. But uh, the comment, I don't know who it was, that um, the directness that circulates are always to the next position, next person or couple. Um, absolutely correct. In a Sicilian circle, if you want to do something like that, uh, veer to the left, couple circulate to the next couple, finish like a Ferris wheel or things like that. You've got to be specific in your explanation. Uh, uh, question. I'm to, one second. I'm, I have yes, a comment. I yeah, uh, one okay. second, Daryl. All right. And that's all the questions in the chat. All right, let's open it up. Daryl. And yes. then I'll get you up. Yes. The reason that I said that uh, you move to the next position is even in the Sicilian circle, I can be in ocean waves. When I'm teaching circulates, I do teach them in the Sicilian circle from the beginning yep. uh, because there's another wave beyond the one that you're standing in, right? That's correct. So if you have the ends circulate, they have to circulate clear to the next wave, in which case they're, uh, they're passing somebody. The idea of circulating mm -hmm. to the next person is something that we try to discourage, or I do anyway. The same with couples circulate. They'll move to the next position, in which case they're going to pass. Now, if, if I'm not mistaken, even in a box circulate, whoever is facing in is going to pass the other one that's facing in uh, to get to that next position. That's correct. Uh, that's, it's probably a minor thing, but... Uh, yeah, that's you are. The way what, what I look at is... You're it. absolutely correct. When I look at the Sicilian circle, however, when I'm doing that, I try and stress that it's two couples facing, working as a group of four dancers. So my circulates are with that group. If I want them to circulate to the next wave, the, they're not standard waves face to face, unless you're lucky to have a lot of dancers, but they're, associate, they're disassociated groups of four dancers. So they work in their own group of four, unless they're told to circulate to the next. I do exactly the same thing uh, as you're talking about, but I associate them to where I want to go for success. So I'll have, to the next group of four ends, I want you to circulate to the next group. And that way they get it. Later on, it'll be to the next group ends circulate or to the next group center circulate, single hinge in your own four box circulate. Or I might do a box circulate in your own four when they are in that progression thing, but it'll still, still within your own four. Um, absolutely correct. However you manage it, you've got to, as with anything, especially with square dancing, I think you said this very clearly, Mike Sikorsky said this very clearly, as long as you are clear to your dancers and they know what it is you're asking, that they don't have to think about it, you will be correct. When you, if you give your dancers a choice of two things, 90% of your dancers will always pick the one that you don't want them to do. That's just general guidance. So just be clear to your dancers and you'll have success. Uh, is, is that pretty much where you were going with that, Daryl? Uh, whatever works for you, Mel. Uh, I still would probably continue uh, because I'm generally preparing them for dancing within the square. Yep. Uh, now I'll use the Sicilian circle for teaching and I've teach most of the movements up through mainstream in the Sicilian circle, uh, or I'll use the Sicilian circle for a, uh, an introductory tip to a strange floor where I'm going through a town and I say the first tip of the night, we do that and I get strange looks, but everybody seems to enjoy it and uh, they get a little acquainted with me uh, while we do it. But just the idea that uh, dancers know that they need to move to the next position to me seems to be probably more important than it is yeah uh, no it's not important uh, sorry it's, it's not just important to you it's important that they do understand that i i always just make it clear that when i'm doing that kind of a circulate that it is to the next group of four because i've always tried to keep this is circle disassociated groups of four uh it's a it's a preference and as i said the best system is the one that works for you. If your dancers understand it and they're clear what you want to do and what you want to achieve, it's it's not wrong. Uh, Bob Elling, you had a, a question or a comment? 
Well, I was going the same place that Daryl was, but there's a another general comment. I'm not lucky enough to have enough squares to, in a hall that will justify a Sicilian circle. And I quite often will just use an extended rectangle. In other words, the whole room is in one square. And basically you're doing the same stuff as in a Sicilian circle, but you have, you just have one square, everybody dancing together. And uh, I can safely say, I believe that my clubs love it when I do that. I, I do that from beginners all the way through advanced. And I'll modify calls that work in this huge rectangle. And I get such a response that dancers having a good time. I think Mike Pogue, if you're still here, don't they love it on, on Sundays when I do that? Yes, absolutely. And it's amazing because some of the calls, and this is at A level, A2. And it's amazing because some of the calls that you don't think would be doable actually are doable when people are are chained like that. Yeah. One of the others um, that work on that, and I've seen that, that this is when I was talking about rectangles earlier. If, if you've got the principle, and you just have, you teach them end dancers to a partner trade, if you've got a rectangle going down the hall, ha have them all lined up. Let's just say they're going lengthwise down the hall, side star through, pass through. Now I've got facing couples. You can do all of your spin chain throughs and all of your circulates and all of that because essentially what you've got is big long waves and it, it is a Sicilian circle it's a stacked eight chain four um, sure this is where the principle what Daryl's talking about absolutely works works like a treat but you've established that in a slightly different formation than the Sicilian circle um I said in a Sicilian circle and you're not wrong I just like to clarify that the Sicilian circle for me has the disassociated groups of four. And when I want sure. to interact with the next one, I make that clear to them. If I'm working in a sure. rectangle, it's like doing a, you know, a relay to Ducey with six couples. You know, you can do it. You just have to give them the continuous float or a spin chain through with six couples. You can and, and interact. And what's really fun, if, if you're into progressive exploding squares, I take some of these things and I get them into a progressive square and I do a progressive relay to Ducey. Yeah. Involving the whole square, moving on to other squares and, you know, progressive coordinates and stuff like that. And dancers like doing that. They like, they feel like they're part of a bigger crowd. And, yep. and like anything else, um, there's one caller they knew that every time that caller went to a dance, didn't matter where he was in the world, you were going to do progressive squares and you were going to do the same routine with progressive squares and became redundant. There's other callers that will get up and they'll do it as a novelty and you go, wow. Um, Chris Beer, I think, is one of those that I'm talking about. The first time I did progressive squares was with him in Germany and he was one couple short in the front square. He walked a couple through the hall and the, the, the gentleman that he put in the head position ha had said, I just got a beer. And he says, okay, it's all right. I'll make sure you get your beer at the end of the tip. And he'd switch the couple on the, the top right with the bottom left of the hall. Everybody else was back in there. How the hell he did that, I have absolutely no idea. I know there's probably a very simple, easy technique to do that. Yeah. But it made such an impression on the dancers. And they were just absolutely gobsmacked. And yet it was all simple <laughs> material. But the effect that it had, the effect, I saw a, a caller, this was also in Europe, do a Sicilian circle, but they, the hall was big enough. They had three Sicilian circles working at the same time. And it was nice wow. simple choreography, but it was so fantastic that the dancers just fell in love with it. And he didn't do anymore. He left them wanting more. And it was, wow, what can you do with that? Well, that's the same thing with your square dancing. That's the same thing with your coach. Anything done properly in the right amount is gonna leave the dancers going, wow. Anything overdone, like taking a Sicilian circle too long, is going to get the dancers to walk away from yeah. it. Going, yeah, that was fun, but uh, you know, enough's enough. Okay, uh, I would like to comment oh, on- I jump in here? Uh, sure. Yes, Mike. Go. Mike, go ahead. 
Uh, let somebody else go first. That's okay. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, what this pre presentation you've done on the Sicilian Circle and how it relates to two-couple choreography has been smoking hot. I think it's just really good, and and uh, everybody needs to read that over and really absorb because you kind of just glanced over some things, and I think there's just a lot of great material there. Yeah. I, and as far yeah, as you, I, me, and yeah. Daryl agreeing on that 80 to 90 percent of normal choreography is two coupled that is absolutely correct um one of the one of the ways you learn to side call is you is you learn to do the two couple limited side on one side call pass through trade by and then let them play with the other couple then you call pass through trade by again and then might, you might have the square flip but you're back with the corner and you can work it from there so all this stuff is really good the only place i really disagree and i mean strongly disagree with the Sicilian circle is during the first six weeks of beginner's class, because if you use it there and you start teaching your fractional turns, they're going to never be able to learn cast off three quarters. They're not going to count walls. They just have a horrible time. And I run into horrible teachers like take five steps, just horrible. So, and it's, you got to correct. You got to do it in the first six weeks and Bob Elling's system of taking six couples or eight couples and putting them in a rectangle absolutely fixes this problem. When you call, when you teach pass through, it's not enough just to tell them to pass right shoulders, tell them to face the same wall. Walls are extremely important. You can't do that in a Sicilian circle when they're on the angle. Now, no, when you go to teach, 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 when you go to teach touch a quarter, it's touch right hands like you're in an ocean wave, go to the ocean wave and then turn forward around that hand one wall. And a trade, whoever they're trading with, they face the wall behind them as they take that other spot. And your, in your take a peak trades as well as your ocean wave trades, they all work and they absorb them very quickly. When you get to cast off three quarters, remember the, the wall you're facing and define this, the wall you're facing is the zero wall and you turn three. So now once they've learned these calls, you can put them in a Sicilian circle and get everybody moving. You got seven couples, you got nine or 11, you, you move them and, and, and it works good, but they've got to know those first. Absolutely. So again, it's the first six weeks of absolutely. class that I don't want, it, that I absolutely don't want Sicilian circle used as the teach position for the first six weeks in any way. So that's my comment. I can understand that. What the choreography with the two couple choreography, and I'm absolutely in agreement with you uh, on the, if you're going to be doing things like cast off three quarters and all that, that should have been learned. What I'm saying is you can use all the stuff in a Sicilian circle. I do use a Sicilian circle probably about the, well, I, I do it right at the beginning uh, when I'm, when I'm dealing with some of the simple, uh, simpler choreography. I don't use any of the fractionalized movements, the turns and whatnot, but I use like big circle mixers. I do the promenade every, you know, and sometimes I'll say every second couple wheel around. And once I've taught wheel around, I don't number the couples one and two. I give them a couple extra seconds. They have a, a good chuckle who's the second couple, but they all sort it out very quickly and we do a quick chuckle, just having a little bit of fun with it. But this is it's an absolutely valid point and I appreciate you bringing it up because you have to monitor what you're doing with the dancers for the dancer success. If you're going to teach them fractionalize this and that, and you're absolutely serious about one wall, then teach that in the situation. As I said, you've got lines, you've got rectangles, you've got tandem lines, you've got coupled lines. You can teach all of that. These are variations and that's why I was stressing. Think of it as a stack eight chain through formation. If you can think of it that way and teach your dancers that way, it's great. As they progress and they've learned all of this, all of this material is great for review in a Sicilian circle because they will now know, you know, if I do a centers in cast off three quarters, they're going to get into that back into, uh, you know, a line. If I'm, if I'm doing it from inverted, a left hand and a right hand mini wave cast off three quarters, I'm going to have the centers taking hands. They know where that three quarters is even though the circle may be here, here, or here across. It's not exactly one wall, but they've got to have that done first. Absolutely correct, and thank you for pointing that out. Agreed. Yes, Bob. Okay, uh, one little, it's been a long time since I used Sicilian circles, 
But back in the day when I had large crowds at my beginner classes, I did. I even did singing calls and, and uh, Sicilian circles. But I numbered the couples one, two, one, two, one, two. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you you do a uh, number two arch, number one dive through and everybody promenade and then sing lyrics to the song. And then when you get the lyrics done, couple number two, wheel around and do your, you know, zero box routine and do it. I did, I did in beginner classes. Oh, golly, I'm I'm two months into the beginner class before I start doing corner progressions or anything. Yeah, you know, I want to, and I, I'm a firm believer when you start a class, you stick with the same partner. Yeah. Now, absolutely. Like I said, this concept has been around for a long, long time. Singing calls in a Sicilian circle formation, and, that, and that's what it is, is a formation, and this goes back to when you think, one, two, one, two, one, two, so that everybody knows who they are. They are not that uncommon. If you're lucky enough to have a lot of those records of the old LPs of the 78s going back from about 1930 through 1950, you're going to find a lot of traditional singing call Sicilian circle dances. And that's what they are. They were just very popular social dances that you would find these things at square dances. Um, I have not, I don't have any. This was really as close as I could come uh, to actually find the, the, the transcripts, but I am sure they are out there somewhere. And if you have some, by all means, uh, you know, share the resources, put them out there, get them to call a lab to the history of square dancing and, and, and some of these things. Let's record a scene call in Sicilian Circle. You can do it for me now. I'm serious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I know you're serious, but uh, that would be a hell of a lot of work, but I'd love to give a crack at it. Well, you like to work. You got no problem with that. <laughs> yes, sir. We'll work together, <laughs> Daryl. Uh, yeah, just a couple of things I'd like to say, Mike. Very good. I, I agree with you hundred percent. But then, and uh, Bob, you as, and Mel as well. You're calling it uh, extended uh, rectangles. Same, same, same. We just. Uh, you have the walls that way, right, Mike? Mm-hmm. But what I really wanted to say before we get, before I run out of internet again. Yes. You froze again, Daryl. Am I being heard? You, you yeah, got you, you until I ran out of internet again, and then you froze. Yeah, sorry about that. But I always like to get them back to their original partner in the Sicilian circle before they pass or move on to the next two. And I move them continuously in the same direction. The reason for that, that I do that, is the one thing that typically is kind of missing, especially for the new dancers in that circle, is the Alaman left, which says that they made it through, that they succeeded. So if I put them back together, they've succeeded. I, uh, I know I'm cutting in and out. I, I apologize. I'm going to try to get this fixed before I come on again, but uh, I'll probably cut off pretty soon. Everybody, it's so nice to see you. Thank you, Mel. Bye-bye, guys. Yeah. Your comment okay. came through clear, Daryl. You, you like getting everybody back together and keeping them together in the, in the two couple zero with a partner keep transition, always moving the same direction. That right. allows and, success. And for, the, and for the newer callers, that's great exercise in resolution. Absolutely. Because if you can't resolve two couples, you can't resolve four couples. Good point. <laughs> one, one of the other aspects of that is if you're using it as a warm up review for the evening, <laughs> is what I find it is probably one of the best practical tools. You're not always going to be able to get them back, uh, mainly because you're going to have an odd couple out sometimes. So if you're doing partner keep modules, you're always going to keep the same, um, keep the same couple or keep the same partner, which is important. 
but it's also, it is another option for you there if you do have to break up couples for whatever reason, and we've all had couples that you do need to break up, that's another option there. But as Daryl rightfully pointed out, and as we said earlier in the slide, it is a good technique for practicing your isolated site and for practicing those initial resolution structures. Fantastic tool for callers and for dancers. Okay, I've got a comment. Yep. Okay, I, uh, it would all depend on the floor and how close the, the couples are in the Sicilian circle. If they're close, and when you pass through, you're already in a box with the next couple, then you can do spin chain through if you want. Because if you step to a wave, they can do all the parts. And there it is. I know because I've used it. And I've had no problem with it. You can even do spin chain to gears. You know, and I, I haven't because I haven't had the group, but I'm absolutely sure you can do spin chain and exchange the gears. You know, you'd have to work it out, but I think you can see it because everybody is going to the center. You know, nobody's going to the outside, so to speak. And to me, that's the kind of thing that's a lot of fun, but that's just me and my crazy approach to calling. I just like to do things. I love to do things that people say you can't do. I use trade, I use trade buys from, uh, from Sicilian Circle because I tell them if they're facing somebody, they pass through. If they're not, they partner trade. So how I would use this in a Sicilian Circle Instead of saying going on to the next, I would call trade by. Then I would do a star through pass through and nobody's facing anybody. And I called trade by again. So they know that the call has the two aspects and you could do either part. You know, you do your part depending on where you are. And so I have no trouble with the trade by thing. And that's just a personal preference. This is what was said um, when you do modifications and variations. Yeah. It's, it's up to you, but as a caller, it's no different than walking into a hall of strangers and having the ability to read the floor as to what kind of dances you have. If yeah. you have the ability to read the floor, then you, your chances are you're going to call a much more successful dance than you would if, if you don't have that ability. If you're calling to your own club, not a problem because they know what to expect and you know what to expect. If you're going to call to, I don't know, go and do a dance at another club and that's your shtick and you want to use a Sicilian circle, absolutely you can. But I would not be doing movements like that. I'd be doing, you know, much more simply. You have to be able to make that judgment call and caller sure. judgment is something that can only be instructed as to how it works, but it can't be taught. It has to be self-learned. Uh, we've got a comment here from Bob. Spin chain and exchange the gears is very difficult because you have to identify leaders. Spin chain through works. Yes, I've done both. Uh, or sorry, I haven't done a spin chain the gears or a spin chain and exchange. I have done spin chain through. I prefer doing that from long lines or stacked eight chains or uh, rectangles rather than the yes. circle myself. I personally don't like doing the trade by, uh, but that's just a personal choice. Yeah. But right, you can do do your part the same as you can do do your part ferris wheel or do your part you know the inside part yeah ferris, you know, that was another one i would definitely use ferris wheel uh, are there any other if comments? they're close enough have we got any have any of the new newer callers that we have online have any of you ever tried using or used the sicilian circle for your uh, club I have done Sicilian circles and I absolutely love them. And if you do it right, um, what I did, I did it during a Colorama session and um, I told them this is what I was going to do. I got approval to do it just to make sure. Um, and the idea was they squared up and each, each square started promenading around. And I said, couple number one, you're in charge, head out to the outside, make sure your entire square gets in before another square comes up behind you so that it's couple one, two, three, four, couple one, two, three, four, et cetera. 
And the idea was I had all the head couples turn around to face the sides. So I got couple one facing couple number two all the way around the circle. And the idea was that they would go in that direction. I could square them up back on the other side and put the floor back into squares. But what happened was I had several people jumping out because they didn't want to dance that way. And I had several people who had not gotten up that wanted to get back in. So getting them back together was not going to work. Um, but all of the positive comments I had were from dancers. They absolutely loved it. They said it was more of a festive atmosphere. They said I got to dance with people that I would never get to dance with because they always square up with the same people. So I had lots and lots of positive comments. I had very few negative comments and they all came from callers. And they were things like, that's not real square dancing. You can't do that. You know, so anyway, my take is the dancers love it. I yes. was just about to ask you that question, Janet, and you answered it before I asked it. I have had the same experience. I have never had dancers complain about a Sicilian circle. They have always enjoyed it. They've always danced it. They've always loved it. I don't abuse it. I don't use it all the time, but I do use it sometimes. Sometimes for teaching, and I almost always start my my club nights with a Sicilian circle. But I was going to ask you. I says, did you get any negative comments? Because I'll bet you they were from callers only. And you answered that question. Dancers like the variety. The variety of the Sicilian circle is such a novelty, without being novel, without being different. It's something that's very comfortable for them to do. And if there is a problem, it's easy to correct and fix rather than, oh, make lines and stand there in a line, wait for the caller to find you or get home and wait till he finishes the sequence to start again. Move to the next means just grab your partner and move on to the next couple. You'll fix it. As a caller, you can call a do si do and everybody is there. Make a two, two beat pause and everybody's there. And the dancers enjoy the feeling of success without having to work from it, but it feels different. It feels difficult. It feels novel and it's entertaining. Excellent comment. Thank you, Janet. Okay, and Janet said something else that's excellent and you got to put it in your thing that when you do it, I love the word festive. It just, it just, it changes the whole attitude of the whole floor and that's what I got to remember when I try and tell somebody else. It creates a festive feel. I like that. Thank you, Janet. There's another Welcome. advantage on uh, Sicilian circus. Dancers don't really like to have repetitive choreography. And when you use Sicilian circus, it doesn't feel like repetitive choreography as it does in a square. Mm. So you can practice a call more often than you, dancers would let you do it in a square. So if it's also great, why are we dancing in squares? <laughs> it's another tool, Mike. That's what it well, is. Sometimes it's being stuck in a rut and not being able to get outside your comfort zone. Yeah. So it's I, I, variety is the key word. It's variety to your program. So I find uh, the dancers have a hard time learning spatial awareness. And I don't really see that Sicilian circles help that in any way, shape, or form. Um, I have used them, and I use them if I have an odd couple out or something, and I really want to teach something that's too couple-oriented, or I want to review something from the previous week, I'll use them on occasion. But I don't typically use them. I've been teaching SSD uh, format for a while and you're trying to get basics out fairly quickly. So I wouldn't have six weeks to not use Sicilian circles if I wanted to, you know, it's like between 12 and 14 weeks of, of the plain vanilla stuff within a square. And I try to reinforce as much of the spatial awareness stuff as, as I can without going overboard. But um, you know, I'd just be curious to know what other people's experience is with um, square orientation and just understanding the bits of the square. I, I heard Daryl mention something about the lack of left element and, and so forth. So if anybody has anything to say about that, I'd be interested in hearing it. 
I'm, I'm going to start with the address one, Matt. When I get my dancers up on the very first night, we're in, we, we start with a big circle formation. We do the element left, we do the right and left round, we do the weave the ring and, and so forth. That, that's a staple of square dancing. It's a recognition the element left is a reward. And uh, Mike Sikorsky mentioned a lot of the stuff initially, you don't want to you don't want to have your three quarter quarter turns, your fractional things defined by a Sicilian circle. You want those walls there. That said, I've been using the Sicilian circle now for 40 years, ever since I started calling, ever since it was introduced to me in Europe. And I have never had a problem with it. I've been very successful with it as far as my dancer awareness, my dancer capability, but I also make my dancers aware, and this is what I'm saying, you have to educate your dancers on the Sicilian circle. You have to educate your dancers on how to use it, how it is two couple formation management. They're working the two couples. If, if I'm going to do a touch a quarter, split circulate, cast off three quarters, they're going to know that that three quarter is going to have those two center dancers touching hands. That's the three quarter. And it doesn't matter if they're fractionally in a corner or they're fractionally facing the wall. They're aware of that two couple formation. I've never had a problem with it. Um, other callers, uh, as Mike Sikorsky is saying, uh, when you, I don't teach that fraction there in the Sicilian circle, but once they've got it, you can use it and use it and use it. It's a great way to review. It's a great way to socially interact. And uh, as we were saying, repetitive choreography, yeah, it's a great way to use and reaffirm. What did we learn last week as the review? Or what did we learn for the last two weeks? Somebody's missed a couple and they've come early, you've walked them through the motions, but now they get a chance to dance before putting it into a square and feeling all that tension. Oh my God, I'm gonna break down the square. It is a powerful, powerful, powerful tool, but it is just a tool. Okay. Um, I I have, I have something to add here. Um, I'm teaching square dance and I'm teaching real hexagon in a pentagon shaped hall. Oh, so, been there. <laughs> so so there, is, there, there is no such thing as count walls in, in a square through or in a touch a quarter because it's five walls in, in the hall. And they're about uh, not, not even length, but close to. And if you go to in, in Ger Southern Germany, if you go to Passau, the square wolves in Passau, they dance in a round hall. It's a circle. <laughs> T count, count walls. Yeah, that, that's, so, that's the nuance of what is. That's where you orient on your collar. But that, we that, goes, use that goes back to the adage that uh, God created man first and put us on the globe. And then to keep us happy, he put a woman in every corner of the globe for us. <laughs> Uh, one thing, I, I've been in that situation. There was a uh, fairgrounds up in Petaluma where they had a Pentagon-shaped hall, and we solved the problem so easy. We took the chairs that were around the edge, and we made a big rectangle with the chairs, and the chairs became the wall instead of the actual wall, and it did it. But I got to tell you, just square dancing in a pentagon shaped room with no reference to walls is crazy. People break down 10 times more than they would normally because they become disoriented. I became disoriented dancing in that pentagon shaped room. It was hard. I had to pick the collar and make artificial walls in my mind in order to be able to dance. You're absolutely right, Guido. It is confusing. Hmm. I'm going to interject, and it's probably going to be a very um, not welcomed uh, piece of uh, information. But when when all this COVID stuff hit, uh, everybody said, oh, well, we're going to go to this two-couple, one-couple dancing with an invisible. So it's like four-couple dancing. And I, nobody around this area wanted to do that. So what I did was I took all the calls that I could do with two dancers, two people, and I was writing, um, and I was writing choreography for that, and then I was recording it to music, and I was just emailing it to the people that wanted to dance that way. 
And the one gentleman came back to me and he said, you know, I had, I couldn't figure out how to do what you were asking to do until you talked us through it. And then all of a sudden he goes, now I know how to do the call because he always used the walls and the other people for reference points of which he had none now. So like when you're talking about Sicilian circles or things like that, if you're in an Alamo ring and the guys are facing in and the girls are facing out and you teach that you take two steps forward, the guys are going to be on an inside facing this direction. Girls are going to be on the outside facing this way. That's a hinge. You've taught them what a quarter is and you have not used walls or anything to do a relation to that. So yes, you, in my opinion, you can teach it. You have to find something to relate it to that they relate to. And what I mean by this is I have discovered one of the best secrets in terms of teaching do -si do and other things, and that is a baseball diamond. Everybody understands a baseball diamond, including kids. They know where first base is, they know where second base is, they know where third base is. If you are facing your partner and you are standing on home plate, your partner is standing on the pitcher's mound. If everybody steps to third base, then to second base, then to first base, then to home plate, you've just done a do -si do When you go to teach an Alaman left, <laughs> if everybody steps to first base, all of a sudden they are in the correct position to do that forearm handhold. They're not reaching out in front of them to grab hands with somebody. When you teach step to an ocean wave, you tell them everybody step on third base, now join hands. Bing, it just hits them and everybody can relate to it. Yeah, Janet, just, just one comment. Uh, my first wife was from Germany. She was dancing a lot longer than I was. Uh, when I brought her down to Lar, where I was posted, we went to a baseball game. She had never heard of or seen it. She'd heard of baseball, but had never seen a game, never understood it, did not know what first, second, third base or home was. So that's <laughs> I'm, I'm just throwing that out there because it is something that there are a lot of cultural things. You make a very valid point, by the way. And, and I stress this back, um, what Mike uh, Sikorsky was saying about the walls and the orientation, what you were doing with yours. If you can explain it to the dancers in such a way that they understand it and they succeed and do what you want, you're doing it correctly if and only if they succeed and they have fun. And if, if that works for you, then you're doing it right. If what yeah. Mike Sikorsky was saying works for Mike, he's doing it absolutely right. If what it's done for Bob works, it works right. Uh, what right. Daryl said about the circulate, if that works for him, that's right. The, the secret to it is not teaching it for the Sicilian circle. It's for teaching it for the square dance and being able to, to impart it in such a way that they understand that when it's transferred into a square or from a square to a circle, it works. They know what you want. So it's, it is a valid comment. And as a last point, don't shy away from controversy because although a yeah. lot of people don't like the discussions, I like controversial discussions about square dancing because it makes people reassess their own thoughts, especially yes. callers. Callers have to rethink what we're doing and how we're doing it. Some things, let's go back to the way we were before we messed it up. And in other ways, Let's find ways that we can improve and identify what's wrong and fix it. So, and we're only going to do that through discussion and controversy. Yeah, I learned something, you know, it's, this is silly, okay? But we, you know, we take a call pass through. And I was teaching uh, third of, or second and third graders how to square dance. And I'm up there and I had already taught dosado. So when I taught pass through, a second grader raised his hands and he says, do you mean you want me to do I do halfway? And it just, <laughs> I went, absolutely. <laughs> and from the minds of children, not knowing that there's these rules, they see things differently. Always be willing to look at things differently. Well, absolutely. And then when you say people look at things differently, if you're ever so inclined, there's a doctoral thesis on the fractionalization and the mathematics of square dance choreography. That's from a university student. I have no idea what the guy's talking about. He has to put the movement up before he puts the algorithms up. 
uh, how people understand it is going to be different. Your job as a caller is to be able to take something like doci do and explain it four different ways to four different people so that they all understand the same thing. Right. <laughs> um, I saw Gene Turner here. Uh, uh, there you are, Gene. Um, you, you've done a lot of uh, writing and publication. Have you used the Sicilian Circle a lot where you are? Uh, not in the last five or 10 years, actually. <laughs> we use it occasionally at hoedowns. Uh, so I guess that's not really true. Uh, we have used it in, in the last five or 10, but not, not very often in classes or anything like that. Thanks for asking. Hmm. I used to use it many years ago. And I think I, I had, uh, Same you, lawyer. I think you wrote an article way back uh, on, on the Sicilian circle or am I mixing you with somebody? I did did write one, but it's been probably close to 20 years. About 20, yeah, about 20 years. Okay. You know, I've, I've, I've been pulling a lot of material back and forth. Um, oh, Mike Sikorsky, one of the things that you mentioned, uh, yes, there was a lot of material, the two couple zeros and stuff that we talked about in here. No, I didn't go into great detail with them. Um, the reason I didn't, this is actually the third presentation we've done on Sicilian circles, and we've done presentations on two couple calling. Uh, but it is an absolutely valid point, and it's what Daryl was stressing, it's what you stressed, it's what many, many callers have stressed, especially the exceptional guys like yourself that we call in the, the legend status. Most calling is two-couple square dancing, learning the techniques and applying it. You can do it in rectangles, you can do it in triangles, you can do it in Sicilian circles, you can do it in hexagons, whatever you want. It Most of your square dancing is two-couple stuff, and if you can learn to master two couple choreography, you're going to learn to master your eight couple choreo or your four couple, eight couple choreography, your four couple <laughs> choreography much, much easier. You Bob get to Burns know here for to do. Bob Elling. Bob Elling. Yes. Is there such a thing as a reverse pass through? <laughs> <laughs> there would be if you uh, visualize it as a half a dose of no. If you do the last half, you're doing the reverse pass through. Yeah, Absolutely. You back up left shoulders and end yeah. up face to face. That's exactly Why not? what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Pass through and those are, reverse. <laughs> those are the kinds of things I would sometimes throw in on my Sunday advance group. Just a wild idea like that. It's amazing the number of callers that calls that you can call and say, do a reverse that. I love reverse calls. Everybody, been... yeah, everybody learns differently. And mm -hmm. uh, the job is not to jam the square holes into the round or pegs into the round holes. <laughs> right, it's reverse Dixie style. Has <laughs> only become fun. popular in the last couple of years, but I've been using it for 40 years. There you go. Uh, okay. Anna, Lars, have you, um, ever used anything like this in your groups? Are you speaking to me? No, Anna and Lars. Oh, I'm, yes. gonna, I'm, I'm out. Okay. I Wait a it. minute. I used it when I was very new caller. I think it was my second uh, group of people because we had a, a big crowd. Um, and I used it um, for the first half an hour to teach a couple of calls for four mm -hmm. people, and then we made squares and practiced them in squares. I know it used to be quite quite popular in Europe using the Sicilian circle at the start of the evening when everybody was coming in. I, I don't know if it is. I haven't danced there in quite a while, so I was just curious. Not anymore, because we don't have big crowds anymore. Okay. Uh, Bob Byrne, you had a comment? Could I? I'll, I'll un unmute. No, no, I'm done. Uh, but uh, the remark about the big crowds, yeah, like, yeah, that's even when we get through this thing, we were already uh, on by the fingernails, weren't we? At least in Vernon, yeah. here we were. Uh, Simon and Susie. Yeah, in uh, English folk dancing, there's a, a formation called a Beckett formation where you have the couple side by side. And you keep the couple together, and that's the what I like to use. 
I often use it for the end of the evening and and finish it with the right and left ground. And when you find your partner again, you swing and you know go home. <laughs> but that's that's always very popular to to end up with a with a Beckett formation. The only the, I think the only trouble is you need to have an even number of couples, but you know yeah, yeah. you can get away with it with an uneven number. Yeah, uh, I think there's variations of the horse and buggy shots each that do the same thing. Yeah, and something then, like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's lovely, lovely presentation. Thank you. Excuse me, is oh, sorry. Hannah, is that Hannah Tannenbaum? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can't yep. you recognize the hair? Oh, there she is. Now I can see those, her. Those lustery blonde I, locks. <laughs> I need to talk to you at some point, girl. We're going to have to do a one-on-one -on -one session when it's a convenient time for you. She records from Riverboat, by the way. I don't know if you do that or not. <laughs> Betsy, have you got anything you'd like to add? First, my apologies for being late. I had a club meeting that I had to attend. Um, I used the Sicilian Circle early on in, you know, in my hoedowns, beginner parties. And I use it to teach a lot of stuff that I'll reuse in squares. Because if something if something is going wrong in one group of four, I have them move, walk past the one you're facing and move on to the next. And I will use walk past the one you're facing and move on to the next before I ever use the term pass through. I just slide that in later. And then Bob was talking about kids and their interpretations of things. I, I was trying to teach in a school grand right and left and these were about third graders maybe and one of the kids in one of the squares was saying something to one of the teachers that was helping and I said I'm like what did he say and oh don't worry about it and I said no tell me what he said and it was brilliant it was it's like the monkey bars but lower down <laughs> and yeah, and I've used that for kids ever since. I never thought of that. Well, I didn't either, but but the kid did. Well, that's back then, you know. They don't have monkey bars anymore in schools. Some of them do. <laughs> but uh, what I learned this with wasn't that long ago, Bob. Well, Ellen does a lot. Of okay, I I I had run into that problem of having second and third graders do a right and left grand. And how I overcame it was face your partner, girls stand still, boys shake right hands, go to the next girl, left hands, go to the next girl, right, go to the next girl, then they're back home. Of course, that's exaggerated. Then I have the girls do it. Shake a right hand with the boy, left hand with the next, right hand with the next. And they can do that, no problem. Then I, after I've done that several times, lets everybody do it at the same time, and then they get the right and left grand right. It's interesting that one of the things I've noticed is, um, and it was mentioned in uh, an earlier session. This time the girls only move. So with the right hand with your partner, right left grand, right hand shake, walk by, left hand shake, walk by, right hand shake, left grand, walk by. Sorry, Mike, I, I, you, you were popping in and out. I, was, I, I think I cut you off there. No, I should have shut myself up. I was telling Jana what, what, how I think that right limb grand thing is, is a brilliant way of teaching, and particularly with people that don't quite get it right off the bat. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I, I thought you were calm. I, I cut you off. <laughs> no, excellent. You cut me off just fine. <laughs> um, now, Mel, 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 oh, yeah. Um, one of the comments that was made earlier was, uh, and, and also came up in Don Beck's session, I've heard it a couple times tonight, and Betsy, it just popped back into my mind. He said, grand, right, and left, and others are saying right and left grand. Um, terminology that we use, and I think I would love to have, you know, somebody come up and do a standardized especially for new callers. This created a lot of controversy in one of Don Beck's sessions, and I know he's going to be uh, hoping to revisit this shortly. But for callers and experienced callers that are teaching and mentoring callers, um, one of the comments that came up is there was a few new callers and they had three really good caller teachers, 
And the first one gave a presentation on choreographic management. So if you're in a box one four, this is what you do. And the next caller came up and get, yeah. And if you get them into a zero box, this is what you do. And the next caller came up and said, if you get them into a corner box, this is what you do. And the new caller said, I still haven't even got the box one four figured out yet. Now we're into a corner box. And I don't even know what that middle one was. And it, it just struck me when I heard right and left grand and grand right and left, especially because we have such a dynamic of different nationalities that if, if one of you accredited caller coaches uh, wants to put your hand up, that would be an excellent session on the old, the new, and what we got to do or however you want to do it. But it's just an idea to throw out there or if any of the newer callers have yeah. something that they would like to actually look at along that session, by all means, throw it forward and we can get a panel together or just have a discussion. Around. Mel, Bob here. Yes, Bob. Bob, Bob here Riggs here. Left and right, Grant? A left and right grand. Yeah. I have seen it. Don't like I, it. So so you don't like it? I use it. Oh um, my gosh. I didn't know it was a real thing. My first speaker's uh, night, I did lot, that. A lot of the times it was a uh, walk walk around your partner, Alaman, right your corner, do a left and right grand and finish with uh, it. and it's I didn't like it, but it's there. Well so Mel, Mel. Yes, Bob, Bob Riggs here. Riggs. Yes, Bob. Um, well, a comment is if we would simply follow the definitions within our own Color Lab guidelines, there is standard terminology for all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, is it left Alamand or, or Alamand left, or is it right and left, grand or grand, right and left? That's an interpretation that's been used for years, but there is a standard already. And I'm not sure you need a, a session other than trying to say, okay, if there's confusion, it is our job as callers to eliminate ambiguity. Absolutely. And that means for the entire floor. So your floor has to understand what you're saying. And if you can't use terminology that matches that, then you need to go back and study a little more. So oh. <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm saying, Bob, is, is not, not so much for the floor of the dances. Uh, it's been a very common thing, and we've seen it like um, a number of times in the discussion at the beginning meeting, uh, the word zero box and zero line and corner line and, and you know, opposite box. And, and, are I, I don't. and then you've got a right, then you've got a right hand lady box or you've got an RBO. Well, that was formally changed several I, years I, ago. I, I understand but we, that. I we just need to that. follow what it changes to. I understand that, Bob. What I'm saying is there's a lot of callers that are mentoring newer callers. There's a lot of newer callers um, that are self-taught. I was pretty much self-taught, although I had the advantage right. of dancers and mentors that go out and they hunt material. And material that they hunt, Yes. looking at, oh, ZB, what's a ZB? That's the kind of stuff. Although it is explained and there is a short piece and we've actually done a piece on that and provided that material here on, on a couple of occasions. It's just something that a lot of new callers have questions on. So I threw it out there. If, if you want, you know, we can look at it. Well, yeah. certainly, certainly there's an issue with, with terminology because I have a whole room of, of documentation that goes back into the 30s. And that documentation includes things like well, if you use Lloyd Shaw's Cowboy Dances, the term swing represents six different things. Mm -hmm. And you have to know how it's used within its context in order to know which swing they're talking about. Swing in that context can be an arm turn or it can be a two hand swing or it can be a ballroom swing and, and there's more. But so yes, there's an issue of a lexicon to interpret all of the old writings that I, I absolutely agree with that because I've struggled with that over the years. So the, this is actually a monumental task as it well. I mean, basically, we have a tendency to overload terms. You know, we use zero for probably five or six different things within the caller uh, teaching curriculum stuff. I mean, there's a zero arrangement. There's the zero box like we were talking about before. There's zero modules. And that's just one term that gets overloaded. We have many other terms that are overloaded. And basically what we're trying to do is communicate. So when we, we can sort of understand what we're talking about, if I'm talking with some caller that 
is an old time guy, then I have to explain what corner box is. But if I say box one, four, you might know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so you just kind of, what I have done is just to try to figure out what the audience is and then speak to that audience to get the message out as fast as possible. But, uh, you know, I was, I was working with um, Jerry and Kip and a couple other guys on writing material and uh, settling on terms that actually stick and are, make sense to people who are reading it. It's really, it's really tough. It's hard to do. Well, in, in Call Lab, I think the general rule of thumb is things will only change on days that end with the letter Y. <laughs> Um, the reason the reason I brought the comment up one second, Yolanda. The reason I brought the comment up is when um, Betsy said "grand right and left," I saw three heads pop up, and they were all of new callers. And it, it just twigged me to uh, a head popping up with a new caller in an earlier discussion when they said a zero box, oh, and, and they had to retrans. You could see them retranslating that in their mind. So the comment was not so much for the experienced callers or people that have been calling for a long time and they're following the transitions and changes in terminology. But it was something for new callers because it's something that's brought up an awful lot in questions. Uh, it, you had to comment. It, I, was I was actually going to comment that that was exactly what I went through. So last year I'd gone to my first caller school and they used terms like zero boxes and zero lines, which by itself was confusing enough having all these zeros. And then I started coming to some of these theory lectures and all of a sudden you guys are talking about corner boxes and partner lines and I thought it was new stuff until I figured out you guys are talking about the same things and then some some of the old, older callers have even an, a different lingo so it's like learning different slangs <laughs> you know, or different <laughs> languages and then trying to figure out it's the same language now which ones are duplicates and I'm still figuring that out you know it's, like uh, what, it's what are exactly the equivalent that. calls and which ones are is new stuff that I'm supposed to be learning, and which is the stuff that's that like 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 a corner box and a you know but, and but a it, zero it, box. It, it's exactly that. It's it's uh, what we have is a compilation a comp a compilation of different dialects and slangs, and uh, the definitions are really a set of jargon. It's not a standard by mm -hmm. any any means in fact just to point out you know when bob and bob were joking about the reverse pass through you know they might present that to a bunch of dancers at some point that a reverse pass through is sort of like the second half of a dosado -do. but reverse as defined for us really doesn't mean that it means to basically change the hands in the counterclockwise or clockwise direction of a call and it only applies to specific calls and so what it, what they're doing there is they're stretching the standard and the definition and they're inventing new jargon new new language mm -hmm. for a set of dancers on that on that occasion and, and so in a way our art is a living language you know yeah. we we can sure kind of go away from the strict definition of things and expand it a little bit to entertain for one night. And, uh, but, exactly. but should yeah. they really, you know, s stick to that or not? I, I, I don't know. I've always kind of um, considered myself a straight ahead caller mm -hmm. and I, and I try not to use too many gimmicks and so forth in my own calling. That's just a personal choice. Um, and then when I'm teaching, I always try to teach my dancers to be successful uh, to anybody who's coming in to call. And that's a really tough task because there are regional differences. And, and when we were compiling modules for the SSD program and we were getting stuff from all over the country, there was a lot of variation and variance in how things were presented. And uh, in fact, uh, when Ed Foote reviewed the document, he crucified me on the fact that things were different. And I said, well, Ed, uh, you know, if you even look at the definition book, Look at the all eight circulate and you'll see command examples that differ. They'll say circulate, all eight circulate, um, uh, you know, different kinds of things. And so right. if it's if it's something in use, why shouldn't it be in the document? So we went through that argument and that took about two weeks to resolve. So, you know, you get two or three people that speak mostly the same language, but you choose different terms. Uh, well, it, it's it can be confusing. Yeah, it's one of the things I, that I brought up. I, I just think of it. I just great. think of it. 
Go ahead, Yolanda. I, I said, I just think of it as gen generational. You know, it's like, okay, now, which generation? Mm -hmm. That's why I've, I've gotten to the habit now of asking a caller how long they've been calling. Because that gives me an indication which lingo I'm supposed to be <laughs> listening for. You know? That's right. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely not alone on that. Um, I was having a discussion the other day, and, uh, and the comment was made from a B1C. Uh, B1C is a corner box. That's uh, Bill Davis's notation you're talking yeah. about. Yes. And, and, and as, as you go back and you listen to it, um, we, we said in one of our earlier sessions when we talked about terminology, um, if I say a 5WP2, you know, 90% of the callers will not know what I'm talking about. If I say a, no. um, <laughs> a right and left brand wave out of sequence, okay, you, you're picturing a wave right and left brand, okay, I've got the sides crossed. Or if I say everybody has their partner out of sequence and you're in a wave, you understand what I'm talking about. Well, the ACCs the, can the, correct. Yeah, the terminology itself is not important except for one aspect, and that is being able to communicate and make yourself be understood with another caller. So if I'm talking to Mike Sikorsky and I'm a brand new caller and Mike is doing a school and he says, okay, if you go from a corner box and I say, okay, I want to get into um, uh, a head square through box. He knows exactly what I'm talking about because I said a head square through box. There's nothing wrong with using the term heads square through box. Bring a static square, head square through that box. He could say a corner box, but that's not always a corner box. A head square through box is a corner box exact. It doesn't matter. What matters is whatever term you use that the person that you're trying to impart that information and get information from is that you're both speaking from the same page. So if you want to call it a, an inside out wapiti splash inverted pickle box instead of a corner box, and you both know what you're talking about, call it that. The reason we have standardized terminology is so that when a document is written or a presentation is made, everybody is speaking from the same point of view, the same point of reference that they can understand it. And the strongest thing that I encourage new callers is if Mel Wilkerson gets up there and says a corner box and you don't understand corner box or corner line, as a new caller, raise your hand and say, I'm sorry, what is that? That's the most important piece of information I can impart to any new caller. If you don't know, stop, ask the question. That way you're all, there's nothing worse than continuing and not knowing what you're continuing from. So that that's, that's my thing. And I just thought it might be something interesting for some of the newer callers. Go ahead, Yolanda. Well, I, I actually ended up talking to one of my um, other fellow uh, students from the same caller school. And I was talking about going to these sessions and, and I was using corner box and partner lines. And the person said, oh, well, I don't want to learn all this new terminology. I just want to continue using all the zero stuff. And, mm -hmm. and to me, it was like, that, I found that confusing, so I have transitioned to corner boxes and partner lines. And so all of a sudden, we had a communication problem, right? Because this other person didn't want to go on to the new, new stuff. <laughs> so that's, a, that's a problem I've had with writing papers. Any paper I write, I have to, I can't make an assumption about what the new caller knows. So there has to be like five pages of background information for orientation and communication communication purposes in in the document itself yeah. <laughs> no one wants well, to read the first five pages absolutely so. <laughs> and and even even with this presentation today on the sicilian circle uh mike sikorsky pointed it out absolutely correct we talked about the two couple things and yes there's more of that i made the assumption because we've done sicilian circle twice we've done two couple calling uh, i should have put a better reference to the background of what we were actually referring to, not just assume that, well, because I've done that two or, two or three times already, everybody's on that page. Absolutely correct. Without, without having a frame point of reference to draw back on, it's very easy to get lost and get confused. And that's, that's just what calling is. Not the getting lost and confused part, that's part of the job. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized how I said that, and I went, that, that, that didn't sound right in my mind. <laughs>
That's when I write uh, stuff like this. I usually put a glossary in the back mm. um, where I explain the different ter terminology and where it's coming from. But to Yolanda, when you have a zero box and a zero line, we used to teach it to new callers as there are zero calls needed to an element left. One way of looking at it. Can you say that again, Guido? <laughs> uh, from, a, from a zero box or a zero line, there are zero calls needed to do an element left. Okay. Okay. Got it. <laughs> oh, that's that's a, that's that's another one. Was it? What we, so? What have we got so far? We've got bot B one C box one four zero box okay. corner box element left box. There's five descriptions of the same thing. And you wonder why we're getting confused? Well, the, the thing is the new <laughs> callers don't understand that they're five, that they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to figure out what the heck you guys are saying. <laughs> like it, we're it, thinking this is new terminology from a so, new theory or something. So Colab okay. has tried to had has tried to go down this route of using phaser to describe these important formations and one of them the corner box uh, if you look at the components there's the formation which is eight chain through the arrangement which is normal couples the sequence everybody is in sequence and then the relationship which is corner or at least in my view it's corner so you can take that same concept with those kinds of components and change one thing like the relationship for instance and then you'd you have the set of four relationship boxes, like the corner box, the R, the uh, right-hand lady box, and the uh, partner box or opposite lady box. And the same thing applies to lines. So, you know, you look at a partner line, heads lead right, circle to a line of four. Um, everybody is with their partner. So the, the formation is facing lines, arrangement, normal couples, sequence, everybody is in sequence. And the, and the relationship is everybody with partners. And you can change one thing in there, the relationship, to get the four different uh, types of lines that deal with different relationships. And so what they've done is they have assigned um, the designations based upon the relationship of the girl and the boy in the squared set. So you have corner lines, opposite lady lines, right-hand lady lines, and uh, partner lines. And same thing for boxes. So those designations are what they're trying to create as a standard now, and everything else is prior art. It's just legacy, legacy uh, terminology. I used, this is Bob Fur from now Mesa, Arizona. Mm -hmm. I used in sequence partner line uh, to describe where I was at in, in a figure and uh, had a, a caller who Mesa? jumped on me about it. He called about 45 years and simply didn't understand the current uh, terminology. Yeah. Yeah. Good no, I, I understand that because we say partner line or corner box. That infers in sequence. It's when we put the O that we out of sequence. Um, and then we it is midnight. Eight. We confuse it even more saying uh, partner grouping, corner grouping. You know, you've got well, those, those are two different box, things. Partner line. No, I, I understand. I'm not, I'm not getting into yeah. the discussion. What I'm yeah. looking at in, in, in specifically is for new callers. Well, it is, it is a confusing world and it is a minefield of navigation. What I, what I really want to impart though is don't stress about trying to learn all the terminology. Use what's current for your terminology, but if you're not sure, ask. But when you're talking choreography or if you have a question, you're not sure whether I should call it a B1C or a zero box or a corner box, just say the box I'm at in it when I do head square through from a static square, as long as the person you're talking to understands what it is you're saying and what it is you want to achieve, you're doing fine. And that's what the important thing is, is to, to ensure that that communication works both ways. If there's well, nothing I, think, I think it took, I think it took two lessons ago 
when all of a sudden somebody said there's an oh well that's an out of sequence with a right hand lady one and it's like mm -hmm. okay so that's so then i had you know a, was one of your, i think one of your sessions and it was like oh okay so that's what that means <laughs> it's yeah. like, well it, it's like what bob fur was saying um you know he might be saying zero line or zero line out of sequence but he said an in sequence partner line that's perfectly clear you know a partner line is in sequence but he but he clarified it if, if it's an over clarification so what um I, I i chalk that up to partner line is clear but he's american and americans love to over qualify like horseback riding yes, yes. where else yeah. are you supposed to sit <laughs> sorry i i had to i had to do it i had to do it you knew it was coming it's an old bad joke, but no, the reality is if he said uh, an in-sequence partner line, it's very clear what he's saying, and there shouldn't be an issue of communication. The issue with communication, unfortunately, comes when we have uh, authors oh, that oh, are very oh. experienced that do not want to adapt, and that's the issue we have with, with callers right now with a lot of things is this is callers in general do not mind sudden change, you just have to give them 10 years notice, and, and that's that's the unfortunate thing. We will change eventually, and hopefully we'll standardize eventually. But it's going to be a long battle. So don't sweat. Hopefully we last that long. <laughs> we will. Mike, can you do me a favor? If you talk, can you just mute yourself? Because it's hard for me to keep two conversations going. <laughs> Thank you. So are there any now? Look, with all this talk of basically jargon, because that's what it is, I used to work in a bank and it was stressed to us in the bank not to talk bank jargon to customers. Mm -hmm. So it's basically being aware of who you're talking to. And if so if you're talking to a new caller, you're going to talk jargon, make sure that new caller understands it. And I did go through the same thing with you, Yolanda. And, and people in general don't like change. Uh, I know someone said to me once when I got married, they said, to get used to my new surname, she said, when I've known you as many years in your new name as your old name, I'll start calling you your new name. <laughs> so, and it's basically because if you've got a caller that's been calling something for 30 odd years, naming it one thing and has to change, it takes time to change and it's hard to break a habit. So it's not a problem I think that's going to be solved overnight. It's just a general thing. And we just have to try and adapt, but maybe for the callers or the tutors, mentors, to be aware that new callers maybe don't understand some things that you think second nature. Yeah. I, I, think I, it, I think it was Bob Byrne that said, the documentation is out there. And we should all strive to get ourselves current. There are uh, a number of accredited caller lab coaches here. There are a number of callers and mentors here that do just that. That said, uh, I've looked at a number of the different curriculums and all the material is correct. But I can guarantee you it's very, very easy for a caller, regardless of how long they've been teaching, how accredited they are, or how many caller lab accredited coaches They've accredited themselves. Sometime during the conversation, depending on who they're going to be talking to, they're going to slip back and say oh, zero line or, or or zero box or or things like that, without losing clarity. And it's like what you were saying, Yolanda. Sometimes you ask in you know at the start of the conversation, how long have you been calling? Because I have to know which you know which reference document I want to index to understand you. What table of contents am I using? What dictionary <laughs> am I using? There's nothing yeah. wrong. What's the wrong is when is you that, don't stop and ask. Yeah, that, that was what I was going to say. If you don't ask, then it, it, you know, just because somebody's in a caller lab accredited caller coach doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to ask them a question. If they, if they get really testy about it, then they're the wrong person to be teaching you. Mm -hmm. And so I have friends who have, you know, work in IT or whatever, and I'm like, they're talking da 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 da, and I'm like, excuse me, what do those initials mean? I don't work in your field. I need to know what you're talking about. And I ask. Yep. Yeah. But sometimes and you just need to know what to ask. I just thought, 
RHO was an abbreviation for right hand lady box. I didn't even realize the O meant something else. Uh huh. Because I was still learning the abbreviations, right? Right. So uh, I, since I didn't realize there were two different options, I didn't even realize that it meant something else. Well, I'm still learning the 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 abbreviations because they've changed. Yep. Well, of course. What are the new <laughs> official abbreviations? I'm looking around on the Caller Lab website. I can't find a document that says I have this is the latest. One. I I am the chairman of the Caller Training Committee, and I haven't found a, a document that lists every single abbreviation that should be current. Period. End of sentence. No, they're 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 not all listed, but the standard uh, release had most of them up. Um, but there should be one document that has a translation. I'm sorry. Oh, I like that. One document that says all the variations of names for a given line. You know, a partner line, a 1P, 2P line. Uh, no, you know. not, not that, Bob. The current, abbreviation. the current abbreviations that people are supposed to be trying to use. Oh. So yeah. which one is it? Is it zero box, corner box? <laughs> B one C which one? Yeah. It's a corner box. I don't box. know. We took corner a box. box. They corner took box. a box. The caller, I like timeout. Caller coach committee took a took a vote, um, and passed that information years ago now to the to the caller training committee, which owns one document, um, and it's it should be uh, corner box. Yes. Gotcha. Corner box partner line are the most current. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. But, but the thing is, sometimes somebody will put a reference in the chat or something, and then if you try and read it, it will say ZB. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and it, you have to know what ZB means. That's not going to change, Yolanda. Yeah. yeah. So. No, that's yeah. Not what, what it means is that callers have to, the new callers have to learn more than, you know, one lingo. That's. that's I understand. So, I have yeah. to learn what Z is. Hey, why doesn't somebody make up a official cross reference list of all these different things and we can say it's a zero box or this could be any number of things that fall into the same as a zero box. All you have to do I mean, is um, collect Ovaltine stubs and then send in to the Annie Oakley your uh, decoder ring. Do I, have to get the decoder? do I have to listen to the radio show to get the right letter to start with too? That, that's right. That's what that's you have it. to do. Well, I think a nice cross reference for all these different terminologies, we could boil them all up into the current, the current form, and then somebody could just look at the current form and run back or sounds, find the one they want great. and go Give forward. Some volunteers. Well, I, I, I would imagine I'm, I'm just being a newbie on the block, but I would imagine of all you experienced callers out there, you would be able to throw up. Uh, I suppose you could start up a thing and says, what What do you call a corner box? And you could get all up. Somebody could just put them all together. And then eventually you would. Somebody would has to be, somebody has to volunteer. Mm -hmm. All right. There you go. Not me. I've just, I've just posted the documents uh, in, in the chat, which was the um, Caller Lab release. It was the training committee release. What's in the name? Um, uh -huh. I, I, I put that up for two reasons. One, it has the currents, and two, Betsy, it was released under your name. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you're absolutely correct. It, it is on the Color Lab website, but it, it, it is a bugger to find. Betsy, yeah. Zed is Queen's English. I understand that. <laughs> I don't have a, I'm not getting into politics today. No, no, that's oh, not politics. God, no. <laughs> but I don't have a queen, unfortunately. <laughs> But you got a king. Here I am. <laughs> no, no, no. But I do have a hungry husband that I got to go take care of. So oh, okay. Yeah. All Bye, I can Betsy. say, Betsy, is you, you brought Bye. up one comment that reminded me of one of my ex-wives. And there, it, everybody says there should be, there should be. And her comment was, don't should on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. All righty. Good to see you guys. Thanks for popping. Bye. Bye. I sent Bye, you an Betsy. email, Betsy. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, I'm. I, I've got an email to answer. Yeah. No later. Worries. See you. <laughs> see you, folks. Bye. Okay, Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that have left, the floor is still open for questions, discussion, anything you want to bring up. Anything I just want to say, um, 
what well, my pet peeve on uh, on a lot of the uh, training materials and, and documentation, even from Coral Lab, is that they'll use acronyms um, and they don't define the acronym. So when I learned to use acronyms, it was always the first time you used it in a document, you put in parentheses what the acronym meant. Yeah. And that would uh, that would help call us along the way because, you know, it, it gets overwhelming when you're, especially when you're new. Uh, when you, you got a document that might have three or four acronyms and all this other new information and, and you get lost in the acronyms and you don't have a clue. So I, I, I just wish that that were always included in a document. If you're going to use an acronym or an abbreviation that it's spelt out clearly. Yeah. That's well, it. Roz, you made a comment about um, when you worked at the bank, one of the things that was there was for people outside of the bank not to use in-bank jargon which is a very common thing. Yeah. We as callers have a lot of jargon. We have, as callers have a lot of terminology and it varies from time to time. It varies from place to place. But we make that assumption that we are all speaking from the same place because we're all using the same 64 movements, the same 68 movements, I should say, as an example of the basic and mainstream. Now, the definition, well, the word definition doesn't exist anymore. It's a dance action. But it's the same for each and every one of us. But I can pretty much guarantee you, even though we're all doing and working from the same page, give us the same 68 pieces of choreography, none of us will come up with exactly the same dance. We may come up with similar things. We may repeat bits and pieces, but it won't be the same. And it's the same with our terminology changing. And I cannot stress it enough, whether you're a, a new caller, a journeyman caller, or an experienced caller, if you're not sure, ask. And I take that back to my very first ECTA convention that I went to in, I believe it was um, north of Frankfurt. Anyway, I can't remember the name of the town right now. But I attended my very first callers meeting. There was 250 callers in this meeting. At least I thought there was 250 people in the meeting. And the panel up on stage was talking and they said, right, and they asked a question. And the question was asked about uh, something from a motivate from an obscure position and the discussion was going and everybody was nodding heads and nobody was asking questions. And I put my hand up and said, I'm sorry, um, I thought this was for new callers and whatnot. I'm, I think I'm in the wrong room. I haven't got a clue what you guys are talking about. <laughs> and I don't know if Bob Moffat is still around, but he's the one that started this slow joined shortly thereafter by Al Stevens saying, you know, it's about time somebody asked a question because they're answering what's asked. And if you get experienced people talking to experienced people, they know what's going on and they tend to lose their audience, which is the newer callers that we want to become. Because without you guys, you know, you know, we're, most of us are well into our sixties and above. We're not going to be here for a lot longer. And you guys are going to be the old pros here in no short amount of time. Ask so, the new thing. <laughs> ask the question. And, and if, if I don't get if I don't get my back fixed soon so that Helen doesn't have to do all the yard work and trimming the trees and all the housework, my time might be coming a lot shorter than <laughs> I think. Mel. <laughs> yes. Um, I also teach dog obedience. I've been teaching dog obedience for about 40 odd years now. And I find when I have a class, I'll say like puppies or whatever. Do you have any problems with your dogs? And you'll get silence. Nobody will say something. And then I'll go say, no dogs jump on people. No dogs are, are digging up the lawn. And I'll suggest things that are common things. And they go, oh, yes, my dog does that. And my dog does that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get a bit nervous about asking a question because they think they might feel stupid. So that will happen sometimes in a group. I know the first time I did the Zoom meeting, I don't think I said a word for about six sessions, eight sessions, something like that, because I didn't want to feel stupid. And I'll still make mistakes and feel stupid. <laughs> okay, so that's just something to think about that I do in the dogs. One of the things about being a caller, if you're not willing to get on stage and look like a fool, you're in the wrong business. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? In front of your dancers this isn't quite as bad. Something, it's in somebody, front of all um, the experienced callers it gets. Who was it? I, 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 said, I think it was Walt this morning. They're talking about showmanship. And they mentioned, you know, uh, one caller, he used to change, he wore 
fancy Western suits to every dance, Cal Campbell, I think it was. And he changed his suit After every tip. between tips, every tip. He, if he'd had 10 tips in the evening, he'd come with a rack of 10 suits. He'd have a different suit on in every tip. I was, that, that, that was, was Cal Golden, Golden. Cal, Cal Golden. Golden. And, and, you know, looking at things like this, he mentioned Fashnacht, which, you know, it's a, it's a German Halloween cross, cross Mardi Gras, cross week-long party from everywhere. And some of the costumes are absolutely phenomenally outrageous. But for square dancing, the, the, he mentioned the collar is expected, it's almost mandatory that you've got to have pretty much the most outrageous costume going. You have to be that. It, it's no different than if, if um, I called it a, a gay and lesbian club in Ottawa and they had a crazy hat dance. It was, uh, you know, I come with a standard hat. I walked in, you know, it was there. Okay, you know, I had a hat and it had a couple little feathers on it. Whatnot. Uh, Larry took my hat and he just made it absolutely outrageous. He says, you're supposed to be a caller. You can't wear that hat. And he's absolutely correct it's expected that you're up there. They're there to be entertained by you, by your presence, by who you are with what is you, not just your choreography, but your stage presence. Your choreography will sell itself, but your choreography is not the biggest part of what you're doing up there. You're there to entertain. You're not there to be a comedian. You're not there to be the life of the party and tell 15 hour long jokes. You're there to entertain with your choreography but your stage presence has to be able to sell that. And you've got to be willing to look like a fool. You've got to be willing to wear a pair of pajamas and have your dancers come up on the stage and strip you down to the nudie almost, uh, if that's what their <laughs> thing is, and wrap you up in toilet paper, because that's happened to me. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're in the wrong business because your dancers need to know that they can approach you, that you've got a sense of humor, that they can play with you, and that you're willing to look silly because then they can feel comfortable saying, I'm not sure, you know, I may look silly, but it's okay to approach you and ask this question. Many moons ago, when, many moons ago, I bought a 10 cassette course by Lira Van Dyke, How to Be an Auctioneer. Mm -hmm. And in one of his first lessons, he said, Have a car in good repair, better than average. Be dressed in clean clothes, better than average. Do everything when you want to be an auctioneer, a little bit better than average. And you can apply everything that's in the course for a caller. For those of you that don't know Leroy Van Dyke, it was in 1956, he wrote the song, The Auctioneer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. See, and I would not know to ask that question. <laughs> I just, that it was believe, related believe to it square it, it, It's one of my favorite songs. It, it's, it's one that I learned and I heard the radio interview once and I don't know why, but I can still almost remember word for word the radio interview. In 1956, Leroy Van Dyke wrote a unique country song using the tongue twisting delivery of an auctioneer. Leroy Van Dyke recalls how he wrote that song. Well, I'd had experience in the auction, but, and it goes on like that. And for some reason that's stuck in my mind because I love that song so much. Well, use it, use it to your advantage. Use your humor to your advantage. Um, Raj, you mentioned dogs, okay? And, and you're, you're heavily into dog training. Um, Randy Doherty used to bring his little dog to his square dances and it would stand up and do little tricks like do I do and the dog would stand up with hind legs and do a do I do around his things like that. But it was a quick break it was not the show. The show was the choreography, but he was willing to do it. Um, we talked about- I could have brought my dog then. <laughs> yeah, different things on showmanship <laughs> as an example, where you're looking at it, there's some callers that tell jokes. There's some callers that tell off-color jokes. But if you, want, if you want something, you want something that's gonna be short, poignant, that you know damn well is going to be terrible, that is the ultimate dad joke, and you know darn well that almost every man in that audience is going to take that joke home and tell it to their kids because that's that's what a good joke is classic example you got two bored dogs sitting there one dog says tell me a joke the other one says knock knock and they both go now think about that for a minute 
I guarantee that is probably the worst joke ever, but you'll all, you're all going to tell that joke sometime. <laughs> you can't help it. The floor is open for comment. <laughs> well, we had a bad taste night one time and Les Tullick was down calling for us at the time and I'd, I'd come inside out, so all my clothes inside out, except I didn't have the bras on. And while he was calling, I went into the toilets and put the bras on so they're on the outside. And I walked in and he nearly fell off the stage when he was calling <laughs> with a distraction. So I did look a bit silly inside out. So I'm not afraid of being silly. So that fits okay. Yeah. So I could do that naturally. <laughs> I, I but I can't, I'm not good at telling jokes. So jokes is just not my thing. But. I was at a dance in Germany and I thought I wish I knew who the caller was because it, it escaped me, but the incident does not escape me. Uh, he, his, he was absolutely notorious when peel off became an, ex, uh, a, uh, an experimental quarterly. So peel off was the movement and his favorite thing was just the girls peel off, just the girls peel off. And about four or five squares of girls in Germany all wore their bathing suits under the thing and they knew he was going to call it just the girls peel off and clothes went flying everywhere <laughs> ah, ah. it was just it stopped he, he, he couldn't continue and he said hmm <laughs> you were expecting you know the obvious comment what is he going to do and thankfully he he, he did use good taste and didn't follow through on any of the comments that were blatantly obvious with that. <laughs> but it, it is something about what you're calling, what you get known for. Dancers recognize what you get known for. I mm -hmm. had 15 different shirts in Germany, only one of which was black, but everybody remembered me for calling I'm the man in black because I, I sang a Johnny Cash song and I was wearing a white cowboy shirt or a black cowboy shirt one day. And everybody just associated that with me for a long, long time. Dancers remember one thing about you make sure it's a good thing that you're entertaining them that positive be willing to make a fool of yourself be willing to oh, laugh I, at yourself there, Let them laugh I've, I've, done that. You. I've done that <laughs> there was a caller who whose stick was that he could call standing on his head mark oh. you know his son <laughs> yep. kim kim was Kim Linder is Marv Linder's son. Marv Linder is the one that uh, recorded the auctioneer, I think, the first time on a old Blue Star label, wasn't it? No, that was Marshall Flippo. Is it Marshall Flippo? I had, yeah. Marv, I had Marv Linder's version of it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But uh, it was it was his son, Kim, that actually got me into calling. Oh, cool. Well, I was against Marshall I, Flippo one night, and yeah, as a very fledgling caller many years ago. And he did that. He, he had this song on Windsor called Louisiana Man. Gotta make a living, I'm a Louisiana man. And he recorded the backside of it. So when people weren't looking, like after the first head square through, he would put his mic down because he was just lip syncing anyway. He put his mic down and he would stand on his head and wait for people to discover it. The problem with that night is that record started to skip. So in the second heads figure is square through three, click, square through three, click, square through three, click. <laughs> Everybody's laughing. He had he had his seasons headstand and he had uh, or his hand his headstand and you know get right side up and then call the darn thing and he was all out of breath while he was doing it. <laughs> I, I remember that like it was yesterday. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um and one last thing that I was just going to mention, if anybody has any specific topics that they'd like to have covered or any suggestions for topics or, or specific things that you would like to see presented or have somebody present, please feel free to send me an email or drop me a line, let me know, and we'll see if we can find the best person for that presentation or a person that's really good at making those presentations. We, as I said, we've got a number of really good sessions coming up. Uh, hopefully next week, we've got Chip Garvey coming up to do a follow-up. Uh, let me just pull up my schedule here. I can let me tell you what we've got here. Um, Kip Garvey, I've just got to get a confirmation from him next week. Uh, the following week, which is the 24th, Bob Elling is going to be back with us. Hi, Bob. Mastering Choreographic Control. Uh, Mike Hayworth is going to be talking about technical zeros. Don Beck is coming back with us. 
uh, doing some more work on identifying difficulty in sequences and how to fix it. Uh, uh, Reinhold Rodick is going to be with us to talk about uh, cholerama, you know, a, a good way of making the best use of cholerama and a few things like that. Um, I've talked with uh, Mike. Uh, Mike's going to be coming back with us. Hopefully, Betsy's be coming back with us. I sent uh, a few other callers the line, and we'll get some more presentations. And if there's other things that you would like to see maybe repeated or expanded on, by all means, put them down, send us a list, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Anyway, that's my product placement for the moment. Floor is back open. <laughs> yeah. Um, how many how many clubs are dancing at the moment or coming back to dancing soon? None here. None here. No. I know. I know. Jeff's got a Australia Day thing on the twenty second of January. Yeah, I know. I know. There's a few few places that are holding open dances. A few places that had Christmas dances. Um, unfortunately, one I got word of they had a Christmas dance and that was fine. And then somebody turned up with COVID at it uh, after the fact, unknowingly infected. And, and I don't know what the transmission was, but everybody that was at that dance, of course, and then everybody who was everybody, uh, so on and so forth. It is still there. It is still something we have to keep in mind of. Um, some places are dancing. All I can say is use common sense. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, I'm living, they're talking next September, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yes, we're starting up. Oh, sorry, Scotty, I cut you off. Jeff had his hand up. Oh. No, I'm just going to say that we in South Australia are permitted to dance now. We have been for a while. And um, you know, most clubs, I think, are back. There's a couple that aren't. I know John isn't, but um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we were just going to start. Uh, we're starting up dancing again next week. So that'll be up in Kadena, and then uh, we'll start the uh, Diggers Delights on the Thursday morning. And the following week, the Wednesday night club will start up again as well. So that's what we're looking at right now. I was looking at a couple of flyers. I think the uh, convention in Jackson uh, is still going on. That's with uh, Tony Oxendine. But I think the schedule cutoff decision of that is coming up very soon, whether or not they're going to go with that. Um, there's also a number of other things coming up. You've got the uh, Northeast College Association School. Mike, I think you have a, another caller school coming up later in the fall. Um, Rick Hampton is doing some online calling teaching sessions on Zoom. There's a lot of other things. So there is a lot of material out there. There's a lot of good resources out there. But keep, keep your eye out on what's going on. Um, Barry Wanson produces Behind the Mic magazine. We try and put uh, any any you know, schools, any of the international schools, not just the, the local association schools, but any of the bigger schools that are going that are open, uh, we try and advertise that. So if you have anything that is in your area that is one of the bigger open schools or any events like that that are coming up that are national uh, side events, send us the flyer on it and we'll try and get them out there for everybody. Um, it may not, like I said, a lot of places won't be starting or even looking at until after June, July when they make that decision point, but Hey, put it on your calendar now. It'd be nice to see people when we do get back to it. So has anybody got any more questions? Any other comments, queries, points? Topics you want to look at? Things you want to discuss? Hello. Hello. Am I? Yeah, I wanted to say something to Mike Pogue directly. And I can't send a message for some reason. I don't understand. I wanted to tell Mike, thank you, my uh, my uh, Mac, my laptop is working again, thanks to you. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, everybody. This was my first session. Pretty cool. When, uh, I didn't realize uh, that many people would be there. Uh, well, it was actually a smaller crowd than we, we normally get. We're usually about 35, 40 in, in that area. Uh, we've I think had, you were up to 40 there once. Yeah, 
We've, we've had up to 100 in a couple of these sessions, but oh, wow, usually, that usually around the 35, 40 mark. Yeah, good to see you again, Mel. And uh, are you here every week or every two weeks or what's the deal? Uh, usually every Sunday at this time. Um, oh. uh, Don Beck has a session on, uh, he, he starts, like I start at nine o'clock, he starts at 3 a.m. So whatever time that is, your time. But uh, 19, uh, 19 hours earlier. Yeah. Are you um, are you on Facebook or anything like that? Uh, I was on Facebook no longer. No, but I am okay. on email. Okay. It, well, if you flick me an email, I'll send you the the the, the times of our session. Uh, both of them are static links. I can send you the link to Dawn's. Dawn's is three o'clock my time, so it's easy enough to figure out. I got to find a pencil. Uh, do you mind giving me that on this Zoom thing here? Yeah. Your email. No. I got, you got Mel's email. Oh, he's, uh, Grace says we've got your email. That's true enough. Okay, good enough. Thanks right. again. It's great. I got to go. We're, no, we're, we're getting close to dinner time here too. Well, you're back in my old stomping ground. So like I said, yeah. I, I, I call Winfield home and you're just up the road. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I spent a lot of time at the, the, the camp in Vernon. Yeah, I just... To bring you up on the situation here, uh, Enderby folded. Um, there's only West Side and Vernon uh, um, uh, Star Country squares are open in the Okanagan. The so Kelowna folded as well, did they? Yeah, it's uh, desperate. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping something will happen after this is all over. I think September is way too optimistic, but. Um, the way we're going in this province, uh, we're not nearly as bad as Ontario and Quebec, but and now there's that new Aussie uh, variant that's uh, that's up and about. But we will be getting vaccinated. They're calling it the Australian variant. Yeah, yeah. The fingers <laughs> pointing to the Aussies now. Oh, it's South Africa was it South African? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Saying, we call it something else. So you got everybody. Everybody blames somebody else. But yeah, it's ridiculous. It came from China. Absolutely stupid. Anyway, um, it is what it uh, is. Anyway, have fun, and we'll we'll try and get on here again. You take care. Good to see you again, Bob. Yeah, you bet. Well, if no, if anybody have anything else they'd like to discuss, it, or if you want, if you want to play, I can leave the room open. Um, you know, everybody should have the ability to share a screen if you want to talk amongst yourselves or, or leave that. But if not, um, I will call it an afternoon or a morning. I was just going to say all the virtual callers, all the ones doing the Zoom calling, they think it's going to go on for a while. Um, and I, aiming at a couple of years, even one caller is going to call permanently on Zoom. So it's interesting how things are changing just to keep our schools up. It, it would be nice if they also have the mainstream and the plus continue on Zoom. And I know before they were just talking about CNA levels doing it. But a lot of us are saying it would be really nice if all the levels could continue on Zoom. So. Well, Don Moshe is going to continue with his calling, but that's the higher levels. I don't know if he's doing the mainstream. I don't think. I don't think he is. So, I, think right, I, I think right now there's probably about um, 25. 30 different um, virtual dances, uh, virtual Zoom dances that are on a regular basis. And they're also plugging in events like um, donation events, uh, big dance with multiple callers. I was asked to, to call it one, one here, an international one, but unfortunately I cannot get my setup here to work off one computer, uh, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> well, if uh, you get it working, Lauren, Lauren would like you to call. Yeah, Lauren, Lauren, so. Lauren does it on a very regular basis. Both, I think yeah. they both do square and round, don't they? Lauren does. He'd like to get an Australian caller on. Mm -hmm. He would. So mm. that'd be good. There you go, Scotty. You're technically motivated. <laughs> <laughs> I've just volunteered you. <laughs> <laughs> I can probably unvolunteer as well. <laughs> probably Jaden or Colin Dandridge are probably the technical ones that I could think of. So anyway, I'm just I'm going to head out now. Uh, if nobody has any other questions or uh, 
Does anybody want to stay and leave the room open or are you guys all good? Mel, uh, Bob Riggs here. Uh, Hal Barnes has written a paper on how to set up your equipment to uh, do virtual calling. Mm -hmm. And he's got some uh, discussion about if you're doing virtual calling where for two cup, most of it's two couple uh, choreography and what do you, what, there's a couple of, I have a paper about if you're doing symmetric choreography versus asymmetric choreography in two couple, um, what the dancers need to know if there are not four people in the two couple, if there's, if there's ghost couples. So there is some material out there. Bob, could yes. you put in the chat the stuff about the Zoom choreography? I'm actually one of those new callers that's doing Zoom, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> I need all uh, the choreography I can get. Love, uh, I'll uh, put my email in here and uh, you can send me an email and uh, I will get it. I don't remember exactly where it is on my computer at the moment, so. Yeah, well, it, it took me a while to find that naming convention from 2017. I ended up having to search the whole computer to find it. Yeah, so. I, I feel your pain. Well, I, and, and I do do a uh, virtual dance every Monday night that can, is made available on my uh, website, which is, it's on my calendar. Um, and so if you want to join, you're certainly welcome to. What, what, what level is that, Bob? We do, a most of it's mainstream, particularly when all the people on are mainstream. And, and once, in, or I, if there are, aren't any mainstream people on, and I know most of them, then, then I add some plus in. Um, all I have to do to make it hard for people is to go asymmetric. And, and we have about half of the Zoom viewers are one couple trying to dance with ghosts and a couple of them that have foursomes. Yep. And uh, it's, it's not a huge group and, and I haven't promoted it a lot but, and most of it's people that are part of my DVD group. Uh, but when the mainstreamers are on, we call mainstream choreography and, and announce if we're gonna do something that is going to be harder. It does make you think when you're dancing on Zoom, especially when you're going from two couple to a full set and back again, and you really have to think. And especially if they go partner trade, you've got to work out, well, am I back in two couple or is which way do I go? So sometimes that gets confusing, but but the callers are very good at giving helpful words and everything. So five, Roz, five. 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 There's only five movements that it doesn't apply to. If, if you bring in if you bring in the ghost side couples, for example, like a heads lead right, yeah. now you have to be very explicit with yeah. what are you calling and when do they disappear? Absolutely. Because they do yes. disappear. If you say heads lead right, do a right and left through, people can do it. Say veer left, do a Ferris wheel, you're, you're in the center now and the, and the sides evaporate. Yes, I think it was. Uh, I think it was Wade Driver that, did that he was doing one of the virtual dance steps with somebody, and he said, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll call." And he said, "Oh, we're just dancing, you know, with with the phantoms," and they didn't tell him it was two couple choreography, so he started calling. That. He was very apologetic about it, but every you know everybody had a good laugh at it. But, well, it, you know, even different. simple things like heads pass through clover leaf, you're now facing your partner. Yeah. Hmm. That, and it's equivalent in 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 a way to a lady's chain, which gets you in, into that kind of a choreographic pattern. I've yeah. learned a lot simply by doing these virtual dances. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that I said in the, um, the presentation on the Sicilian Circle: if you're going to use that kind of material, work it insides and outsides. Get the star through, so you got forward and back, and you can use all of this material or virtually, no pun intended, all of this material from the two couple calling and from the virtual dances that is done there, you can use all that in the Sicilian circle, including things like your asymmetric choreography with your resolve to home with the two right. couple. 
there is a lot of really, really good material out there. And if you take the time to play with it and learn it, you're going to find that working with two couple choreography will greatly enhance your calling to a full square. Mm. It can't help but do it. Malcolm, did you have your hand up or were you just scratching your head? Oh, well, sorry. I, I saw you. I saw you go like this, and I wasn't sure if you had your hand up. Or something. No, I wasn't going to say anything, but I will just one of the things, just going back to the original presentation again. Um, but uh, I mean, I've never even given the Sicilian circles a thought. I mean, I knew about it from um, folk dancing and uh, conchas. But um, one of the things that uh, I've noticed, particularly with a lot of the, the new dancers, is if they're doing the square through, the number of them that, that, that turn out rather than turn in. And it strikes me that, they, that doing that Sicilian circle would be a very good method of getting them to actually turn in, um, to, or to get them accustomed to turning in, because there's nobody else outside them to, uh, to confuse them. So that if they're only dancing in the four, it would be a really good one to, to, to correct that very common fault. Absolutely. Um, like I said, one of the, the big advantages of the Sicilian circle um, is that the dancers learn two couple formation management because they think that way and they learn not to anticipate or not to worry about what anybody else is doing. They learn to dance their own part of their own group of fours dance for what it is they're doing. And it's such a strong, strong reinforcement tool. Uh, John, um, in, info sheets that I use. What what info sheets are you talking about? Your uh, information sheets you use at the beginning of the when you in your presentations. Where can I get a copy of them at? Because uh, sometimes on of, of the my recordings don't work. Um. Can you download directly off of? Um, I can download, yeah. Okay, hang on a second. I'll, I'll post them back. I'll put, post the PowerPoint and the document in, in the chat. Give me, give me one second. I was just wondering if you had them in newbie callers or anything like that. Uh, they, they do get posted to newbie callers. They will um, be? Yeah, Mark does that as well. Oh, okay, then that's fine. I can get them Mark, out of there. Mark does just about everything. Okay. I, I, I would be absolutely lost without him. <laughs> Mel, would you mind posting those on there today? Because I'm not on Facebook. So yeah, just, uh, you have to go to the Facebook yeah. site to download them. The other site, you yeah. can get the videos. Yeah. If, um, if you can't download them off the chat window, just send me an email with what, you, what you're, you're after, and I will gladly send them to you. Okay. Yes. There you go. I've just posted the two back in the chat window here. So you can just right click and download them right, right out of the chat window if you want as well. Yeah, because you had one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I couldn't find the information sheets on them in my recording. For some reason, when I record it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't save it. And I don't know why. Which, I got to find out. Which document was that? Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, but you had it on your uh, just your other uh, program, so I was able to watch it on there again. On your uh, teaching, uh, your OCC or CC, but I can't think of the name of it. I was just looking on here. You know, in the first one we did with this was 2000, April 2019, was the Zoom, first Zoom presentation on Sicilian circles that was given on the 31st of May. We've been doing these for that long. We never really started. <laughs> yeah, we never really started getting into them until COVID hit. Um, now I'm just date modified. What do we got? Worksheet equivalent Zoom meetings. Uh, basic is not boring. No. I'm just 
looking to, to see which which document you might be referring to. Do you remember what the title was? No, I don't remember. Uh, 08, 11, uh, new caller development, 11, 29. Technical zeros, my newest best friend, Kip Garvey. It was about three weeks ago, I believe. Before uh, Christmas. Oh, the last one before Christmas? Yeah. That was just an open discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was no no formal presentation. It was just a carry on and and, dis and discussion of using some of the techniques and everything else that, uh, that was gotten because some people were going in and out. That, that's why there was no documentation for it in, in particular. Okay, because you uh, I looked in and I was, uh, I saw an email. You, did you have a class the week after the Saturday after Christmas or, or something? No. The class? No, we, we had the one before Christmas and then we shut one down. Before that was it until now, right? Yeah, that was it until now. Yeah. Okay. I, I've, done a, I've done a few things on Zoom, um, but that's just you know, private one on one or, or small group things. So I haven't really done anything formal like this. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, great. I just got an email from Tony. Good. He's coming in to do some presentations as well. Fantastic. Uh, if there are newbie callers, I can find them in there. Then, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mark, Mark, and if, if you're if you're looking for them, they're also on the OC callers website. Uh, all yeah, that, of the, all right, of the yeah. presentations and documentation should be there as well. Yeah, you used to have them on there. You used to have like it's like an attachment on to it on that clip on that yeah. OC, and that's not on there anymore. That's why I was wondering. Okay. I uh, will just just put Mark an email uh, if if you've got his email or if you can get in touch with him. Okay, I'll send you an email. Um, okay. Thank the, you. The other the other Bob Bob Elling, I sent it. Obviously, not you're not doing your chat because I asked if I could have your email again. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm not really good at this chat thing. I'll try. I didn't see it, uh, but I I think I got it figured out. Let me know if it works, okay? Okay. Uh, participants, come on. No. Anyone on the sky? See everyone. Oh, nice so to there see we you go. again, Ross. Well, yeah, I'll see you dancing, Yolanda. Yes. Oh, you must click on chat, not participants. Yeah, you have to put it in chat part. Okay, chat. Next, next to participant. I know, I tried. Okay, Bob Briggs, okay, now. Help me out, Mel. What? Put my email address in chat for everybody. Okay, give me a second. <laughs> I'm really trying, Yolanda. <laughs> it's, it's okay, I've been, re I've been rearranging my Calling stuff. I'm then oh. I can't find it. So oh. now look at spinning that's wheel. Okay. Um. Bob, that's something easy to do. At the low at the lower end of the screen, you have a something that says type your message. And underneath that you just type your message and hit enter and it's then to do whatever you want to. I was able to do that late earlier, but I get a spinning wheel right now. It's not working. You work oh. on a mess, don't you? Excuse me now. <laughs> I said I've you even got my, box, don't you? <laughs> and I have my back expert. My wife came in and tried to show me how, and it didn't it's work. Frozen, yeah. It's frozen. Yeah. I got what's in the back world was called the spinning wheel of death. <laughs> oh, am I shouting? I'm yeah. sorry. It, well, it's better than the DOS world of the blue screen of death. Okay. Oh, it, okay. We cleared it. Now try it. Now try it. Yeah. yeah I've already posted it in there, Bob. It's that, Start it up again. Yeah. It, yeah. It's not working for me. Did you get the address, it, Yolanda? I, I, I did. Mel posted it. Thank you, Mel. Bob Thank you. Elling at gmail.com. Bob dot Ellie. <laughs> 
I am I am going back now to the nice old fashioned you write the addresses in a little book. <laughs> I'm waiting for your email, Yolanda. I know I'm expecting I need it. Yes, and, and I lost the email, so I had to wait until we were in the session. There, there, there is one other thing that I would really, really like to maybe bring up maybe sometime in February and March, yeah, and that's Color Lab. I'd love yeah, to have yes. a presentation on Color Lab, what it is, being a member. Like right now, there's a rather, in some cases, heated oh, discussion is. going on about the basic and mainstream you know program. Do people want to make changes to it? Some people are making changes. Oh, and you will. Thing. On a proposal, there was a technical omission of lead to the left. It wasn't explained. It was in one side, but it wasn't explained in the other side. Lead to the left is a definition. Do we want to make additions, subtractions? What do we want to change? Those are phenomenal discussions for new callers. And if you are a caller, especially if you're an international caller, okay, and this is no, no slight against American callers at all, but if you're not an American caller, I really, really highly recommend that you join Caller Lab and that you do get involved. Um, in international callers, they follow Caller Lab religiously as far as this is the program, this is the dance action, this is the definition, this is what Caller Lab says, because that's the median standard. And all the complaints in the world about what Caller Lab is doing or what the problems are with square dancing, the best way to effect change, the best way to handle change is to get involved. So and when well, you are when you are looking at things, I hear this comment come up all the time. Uh, Oh, in, in, in the Czech Republic, we don't have that. We've got hundreds of new dancers coming in. Uh, in, in Europe, oh, we dance this all the time. Uh, you know, in, in Germany, this is, this may be DBD advanced, but this is what we call standard mainstream dancing. This is club level mainstream uh, in, in Germany. In Japan, we do this, but we don't use those terms because we drop all the filler words. All of these things come up, even in Australia, the difference between a tip and a bracket. All of these things make big differences. And Caller Lab is set, and it sets its standards by the people that are involved. It's a very democratic process. People have input, people have action, but it's usually the same people that are saying their opinion and following along. And as things change, we've got a very small demographic setting a very large impact. So if you want to have a voice, be part of the organization to have that voice. Uh, Bob, you had your hand up first and then Yolanda. Okay. Oh, um, I, I just want to say you're right on Mel. People need to realize that Caller Lab is a committee dr driven organization. The committees do the work. This dialogue you were talking about, about lead left, is part of a dialogue associated with what's called the triennial review. Mm -hmm. Every three years, they start a process by which they review and look at the programs. And members of the committee, and this is the importance of being a member of Caller Lab and being a member of the committee that, that you call at, um, those committees are sent emails to say, hey, do you want to see the addition of a call or the removal, the dropping of a call. Understanding that if you drop a call from basic, it automatically becomes part of mainstream. If you drop a call from mainstream, it automatically becomes part of plus. That other next committee has the chance of saying, no, we don't want it. Or they have the chance of saying, we do want it or, or not addressing it. But recognizing that those decisions are made by the basic and mainstream committee, the plus committee, and then on through the advanced and challenge committees. That's called the triennial review and every three years they start this and they just started it again this year. And the dialogue that Mel was referring to is the very first dialogue associated with the basic list. Do people wanna see ads or drops from that list? If you wanna be involved in it, join that committee, e email the home office, of Color Lab, and you can be part of that discussion as well. Yolanda. Yeah. So if you want 
a newbie caller's perspective, and it's not just mine, I've talked to several of the other newbies, is we were interested in Caller Lab because we wanted to look up some stuff. I actually wanted two couple information. And we had somebody on that was explaining stuff about Caller Lab. And several of us have tried to use Caller Lab and find it too difficult. We can't, it's too, it, we're trying to spend too much time trying to find something and not getting anywhere. Are you talking, you're talking to Caller Lab uh, website? Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah. I left, and I actually left an email and I didn't get an answer. So, because it was, because they had said, well, if you have questions, then email them and. Okay. Yeah. The one aspect is the Caller Lab knowledge base. And it is, it is a cumbersome part of it to use. If you understand it, you can navigate it. If you don't understand yes. navigation, it, it is quite difficult. But most of the documentation that most new callers would need, you don't even need to go into the knowledge base. There's a, a section there called, there's a link called Caller Lab Documents. It's open. Uh, there's also a members only area. Most of the documentation is there. What you get in the members only is the minutes of call lab meetings, uh, some special recordings and whatnot, or snippet recordings that were in um, given in presentations and things like that. And you get access to a couple of more things. But most of it is all open source information. Um, well, I know several of us newbies were finding it. Yeah. You know, and, we're and being asked these, to these reference are the to kinds of things. These are the anything. kinds of things that I would love to know about because I, I would really like to get somebody from Caller Lab. Uh, you know, if I can, if I can get the chairman of Caller Lab to come in to say, right, this is what it's about. This is why you should join. You know, we are a small group of callers. We're the small group of committee. We've been the same people on the committee for the last, you know, three hundred and seventy-five thousand years. It's time to get new voices because it is international. I got Jeff and then I've got Guido. Did, did that answer your question, Yolanda? Sort of. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if you're having any specific issues or something you're looking at, just send me an email and I'll see if I can okay. set some time aside to walk you through it. Jeff. Yeah, why is it though that in America, most people rush from plus from mainstream to get to plus and there are not many mainstream clubs around? That's uh, the biggest problem I found when being very, there. Yeah, very, very simple answer to that. And we've explained a couple of times. Um, Bob Elling was talking about a group that he had and the way he was doing it. And he, he, he reined it back and went from, you know, six squares to 400 and some odd dancers. And they were dancing basic and mainstream and having a great time. And the plus and advanced dancers took umbrage to it because their numbers were dropping what was going on, the dancers were having a good time because he's giving a good show, good entertainment. And they don't want to dance for the entertainment without losing the status of being a program. And this is not politically correct, but there's this rush to plus was created by callers for callers, not for dancers, by callers for callers because callers at that time through the mid 80s to the moderate to late 90s, were basically very lazy, not all of them, but very lazy because calling plus is easy. If you've got the mainstream program, you dance in standard position and you don't, the plus all you're doing for variety is adding more movements to the program and selling it as a product because it's easier. It's easier to call, that way it's easier to dance. So I can pull the dancers up. Then as they recruited, their dancers got older the people their dancers were bringing in as new dancers were older and the numbers started dropping and they couldn't financially make it feasible. So now the basic, the mainstream and the plus club are combined into one night, but you haven't changed the mindset of how we want to bring these people in. Oh, we've got to get them up there faster so we can dance as a club to be financially viable. The teaching ability dropped in level, in capability for the most part for new dancers to rush them up so they could actually be financially viable to get two or three squares on the floor to pay for the hall at the night. And when they went to go and dance the plus dance, of course, they weren't able to dance. A lot of them dropped out. Others joined other clubs. And it's just an escalator of disaster that is so easy to see and predict what's going to happen that we allowed it to happen over a period of 20 years. This is what's created the problem. Even here we get, oh, come to plus. It's the fun level. 
That is the most abhorrent comment I have ever heard. Come to plus, it's the fun level. Whenever I hear that, I want to just go up. I haven't done it yet, but I want to go up and say, who's your club caller? Because he's an idiot. You know, I've, I've never said that, but any caller that teaches their dancers that come to plus, it's the fun level is not calling basic and mainstream the way it should be. But yeah, that, that, that is true. But things that are basic, facing couples spin the top. A lot of them can't do that or right and left through out of an ocean wave. And these are basics that they should be taught yep. and they don't do it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, Guido. Yeah. Guido first and then Bob. Going back to Yolanda's question, I took part in a meeting on Thursday with the International Advisory Committee of Caller Lab. Mm -hmm. And they and Ken Vitusi meanwhile recognized that the Caller Lab website needs to be a rework. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and also because, as you know, I speak English is a second language to me. Actually, it's the, the fourth language Mine that well. I learned. Mine as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, my, my mother language is Bavarian. I grew up in Stuttgart, which is Swabian. Then I had to learn high German in school. And so English is the fourth language that I'm learning. Um, and the, the, they will uh, change the website also that Documents are easier to find if you look at a different language. Uh, we, we know it's a problem. Um, I'm fighting for years to, for instance, get the uh, press releases uh, before they appear in the direction just to my inbox because I'm, I need them for my Acton news. And, and the deadlines for the news don't fit to the um, publishing date of, of the call lab direction. But actually we need callers like you in the committees, especially we need callers from other countries than the continental US because um, the US callers are still the majority and they decide everything. It doesn't matter if you're against something, if if there are 60 US callers, they say yes to do something, and the 40 callers from overseas say no, it's still a yes. And uh, the continental Americans usually don't care about what's abroad. They see their own home market and they decide for their own home market. Mm -hmm. And um, so we need callers from outside the US to also decide so that their, the, the prevalence is a little bit less dominant. Yeah. Or balanced. Yes, Bob. Balanced. Balanced. Yes. So um, I am a member of the executive committee of Caller Lab. There are five of us on the executive committee. And uh, I just wanted to comment on, on a few of the things that have been brought up in the last five minutes. Number one, there is a website rewrite or recreation going on as we speak. And about any of the issues that were discussed here are to find things, to be able to find things easier, to make things more accessible is one of the keys uh, that are working on that. Um, the second thing is I will take the request mail for uh, a presentation here on Caller Lab to, to my fellow committee members and see if we can make something happen. Uh, they yeah, had- I thought, I thought I was being just a bit too subtle. <laughs> no, you weren't subtle. Uh, actually, Dana did a presentation for the class session that was being held uh, over here in the States. And we'll see if, if we can get that to be part of your environment as well. Um, also, the timing of publications when they have to fit into things like the ECTA publications and so on, that's always a problem of when it gets 
created, when it gets approved, and then how to get it pushed out uh, in a timeline. I'm not sure there's much we can do about it because there is a lot of timing involved in it, but it will, we'll discuss it. And um, the, the comment about the involvement of international callers, there's been a lot of discussion over the last two years about how do we get how do we get more involvement of the international callers so we can have a perspective from around the world? The, when we don't have many members from around the world, as you said, you don't have balance. You don't have the perspective from the other parts of the world. And we, we on the executive committee really want to see that perspective from around the world. Uh, we may differ personally in a, in a decision uh, about one thing or another from other parts of the world, but we need to know all the facts and be in, and have the involvement of all the callers in the dialogues. It's terribly important that we have that dialogue or we don't know what, so theoretically, we're doing to you. We also have acknowledged over the years that there's what's called regional differences. And that regional can, difference can be what Australia does versus what Denver, Colorado does versus uh, Germany does. Those differences are allowed. And in fact, that those two need to be accepted, but they need to be understood as well. We have to understand that these things are going on and say, okay, it's still square dancing. It's still what we're, what we're doing. And this difference is okay. But then exactly. we have- that's actually a very good point, Bob. Regional differences, unfortunately, that's a term that was thrown out with the do si do and the do pa so uh, when that came about. And then for over the last many, many years, regional difference became an excuse for the technical monstrosity caller to say, well, it's regional differences, whereas most of the callers with common sense would say, no, that's just bad calling. I totally agree. Uh, I've been I've been doing this. I've been calling I think almost as long as you have Mel, <laughs> and I do I refer to myself as a little bit of anomaly because I call for the once in a lifetime dancer through the once a week dancer, yeah. or twice a week dancer so to speak, and the program and the vocabulary that you use for each of your dancer types is different, and. Yeah. I do a huge number of dance parties for non-dancers and teach, and I'm a big advocate of SSD. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can make that some, into something that's real for the organization. Uh, but mm -hmm. I wanna get to the point that um, we at Polar Lab are interested in everyone's opinion, but we can't hear it if you're not a member of Caller Lab first and a member of a committee of material that's important to you second. Yeah. Well, just, just as a tentative, uh, if you want, I can tentatively lock you in on the 28th uh, just to give you a time frame, make it easier for the executive, 28th of February. Okay, let me, let me talk it up and see whether I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just put that as a blank. I'm, I'm still waiting for confirmation from uh, a number of other callers on different topics and whatnot. Uh, I've just put what we've got scheduled up to the 21st of February right now. But uh, like, like I said, I, I can just I can hold that date. But if another date is more suitable, that's fine. And just if if, if you go to them, because it is something it's always been important to me. Uh, I, I let my Caller Lab membership lapse for a few years when I was in transition uh, playing soldier around the world because I just didn't have time to call or do anything. But as soon as I got, got here to Australia, I rejoined again. And mainly for that, I started in Germany exactly the same thing. It was to have a voice to also know what was going on, but to be involved in that, even if it's understanding what is going on or why it's going on, is very important. And I saw that big gap of international callers. Um, Caller Lab had this thing, they were going to do the mini labs in different countries because it used to be a requirement you had to attend a Caller Lab convention before you became a full member of Caller Lab. That, that no longer exists. And, and these are things that the myth behind it still exists. Yeah. But there's a lot of people that aren't even bothering with Caller Lab because 
and I hate to say it, and you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm the most politically correct, sens sensitive diplomatic person. <laughs> um, a lot of people around the world are not getting involved in call lab because they think, well, American callers, a lot of them are saying, well, we don't do that here anymore. It's not done like that. Our dancers, if you called that here, all our dancers would break down and leave the hall where it's pretty standard somewhere else. Well, that may be a localized issue within the States because you can go from one club and say that in our area and go across the street or across the city to another club and it's a completely different dance atmosphere. But it's that one voice that gets the vocal majority because that's the only voice that's participating. And we've got to get all those voices, even if it's a small collective of voices representing different countries where this activity still exists, to at least put input to this machine so this machine can still keep going. Absolutely. So um, I would well, love to, I, would, I would love to have there. Here's a, this is what we're all about. This is what's needed. This is how to participate. This is how to get involved. And just let us know. You know, it may not change anybody's mind, but at least it'll be out there, and it'll be said that you know this. You can help. Here's how. Um, well, the you just mentioned the the mini labs. Yeah, uh, it already is a long time ago, but I guess in '94 was a mini lab in in London. Yeah, and there George White, who was running the office of Call Lab, said to the callers after a question, "We don't care about Europe." Yeah, I know that's oh. a long time ago, but if a, a manager of Call Lab says running the home office, we don't care about Europe. Uh, what, do you what do you think? How many members do you gather in that area? What, what a lot of people have to recognize is Europe right now probably has as many dancers as North America. Yeah. You know, when, when you add, I mean, Europe is a massive place, but, and, and I, I can tell you right now, they have a lot less than they used to have. Um, you know, I, I went to my first big, the biggest dance I've ever called was, I believe it was 8,000 people. That was a massive dance. And I haven't done one of those since the early nineties. The biggest dance I've seen lately, um, well, I, I moved to Australia here and, and I'll use that as a good example. I saw a lot of old footage of dances. They used to have competitions, not, not competition elimination dances, but competition dances where they come and they call us square dances and things like that. And there was things like $10,000 first prizes to the clubs. You know, this, I mean, this is going back a while. When a square dance caller came over, they were mobbed. They got bigger crowds than the Beatles got. That's what it was like here. Massive, massive crowds. Conventions were massive, massive things. And now I see this here. I see this in the States. Oh, we had a really, really great turnout for the national convention. We must have got at least almost 1,500 dancers. We must have got almost 800 dancers. Something's fundamentally wrong, not with our activity, but what we've done to our activity. And that's what we got to fix. And the way to fix that is to get involved and say, right, what's right? How do we improve it? What's wrong? Let's get rid of it. But I'm a very politically correct, sensitive, and diplomatic person, so I will never say something like that. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in the same category. When, diplomacy, when, when somebody invented diplomacy, I was not there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that applies to me for sure. <laughs> Um, there, Bob. Yes. Elling, sorry, Bob Elling. Yes. Um, what labels are you, you, you've got Rawhide, you've got what else? No, 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 no. I own Riverboat. Riverboat, sorry, Rawhide. Riverboat. Red Boot, Red Boot, uh, Gold Star, J Bar K, Red Boot Star, all the versions of, of Red Boot. Okay. Anything that was done or recorded by Don Williams. Yeah. And he did a flutter wheel was a label. You know, there are minor labels that only had five or six songs 
that yeah. were pay labels or whatever, or when he brought them in. And uh, actually, he, he took when he bought J. Bar K and he liked a few songs, he took the music and actually released it as Red Boot. And that's why I take it re release when I put it out again with a collar doing a more standard or a collar that's alive or or that I know I'll put out the music again under the new person. As you know, you're doing a few for me. Uh, the reason the reason I was asking, I was thinking about um, like you've got Royal and Sony and you know you've got the, the massive labels there that have studio productions, etc. But there's also a lot of producers that are studio productions that are home productions that are re-recording. And I, I was kind of thinking, I don't know what, what your um, relationships are with uh, guys like Rod and, and um, um, Rick and, and Rick Hampton and, and those, uh, but about record production, what callers want, what callers need, what you know aspects that are going on and what actually goes into this, it would be if, if nothing else, more of an, of an interest of what actually goes into making one of these, um, the music track, what goes into making the vocal track, what to do, how to go about it. You know, because it's, it's a very, very different beast than it was getting into a recording studio, recording a vocal track, and then getting it sent for record pressing and everything else and coming out with a thousand dollars out of your own pocket. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was. Just, was... Something to keep in mind, maybe for you know mid March, towards the end of March, if you're interested in it, we'll have a chat about that as well. Yeah, I'd love to. So, so Bob, yes, Ellen, I have sent you an email, so hopefully you got it. And I used one of your records then for my one of my Christmas uh, Zoom calling sessions by Don Don Williamson. This one. Yep. Which one's that? I did White Christmas Number Two. <laughs> By Don Williamson. The popular one, yep. It's, uh, okay. it's from Red Red Boot. But I uh okay, and I own that or before I bought the Red Boot label, I recorded my own version of Right Christmas. And it has its sales have been phenomenal. I did not re-release the Don Williams version. Well, at least I, I still have one of the originals then. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. But I have the better version. <laughs> well, that that is your opinion. Until I hear the your version, that's up for grabs. Was, yeah. Uh, well, Mel is from Australia, and I I did my own version of uh, oh gosh, what is the name of the song, Mel? Uh, Light the candles. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I just got an email and talked, chatted with a caller from Australia because the original was done on Aussie Tempo. And he said, I've used that for eight years until I heard your version. Okay. Now there's now, no question. Now I need to ask a question. Go, go <laughs> what, ahead. What does Aussie Tempo mean? <laughs> that, that's the... <laughs> Okay, Riverboat is my music. Ozzy Tempo is an Australian uh, label that oh, has okay. been recording, See? and they still do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but we have different things. Uh, I am separate from almost every label in the business in that they strive to copy the original song. I want to take the original song and make it a square dance version. I'm very picky about my rhythms and stuff. And that's the two differences between the Aussie Temple version. It's more like the original song. And I try to capture the original song, but use a square dance tempo in it. And that's really different. And that's why this caller, when he heard my version, it was no no doubt he switched over to mine and ordered it the next day after he heard another caller using my version. Their music is awesome. It's very good. 
but I want I want a version that <laughs> makes people dance to the beat of the music. And that's what I have the stiff with. This advertisement has been brought to you by Riverboat Records. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. My latest staff <laughs> caller, Mel. <laughs> Bob, you got to get your licks in when you can, man. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to have to scoot off here. But uh, if anybody wants me to leave the room open, I can. By all means, feel free to carry on the discussion. But if nobody wants or has anything else they want to discuss, uh, I can close the room. It's entirely up to you. Okay. Anybody want to talk to me, Yolanda? <laughs> <laughs> if you guys. If you guys want to keep going, by all means, please do. I'm just going to depart now, but I'll leave the room. Okay. Up. Have fun. Thanks for coming, everybody. I still get confirmation. I still got Chip Garvey tentatively booked for next week. Uh, I'll get a confirmation. If he's Good not here, I will definitely have it filled in with somebody. I'll let you know by Wednesday. Take care, all. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Mel. Uh, Yolanda, I did not get a. I did not get an email from you. Oh. Well, that's a problem. Yes. Because I did it while we were talking. I now have two laptops. <laughs> so I feel so luxurious. Okay. It, unless it's my old laptop is slower. So I, uh, get, in, I get emails and it takes, I've, I've actually had a friend that had brought his laptop. It oh, took wait 15 a minute. Minutes. It took 15 minutes to get an email. Okay. Check again. Oh, I got it. Yes. yes, I do have your email. It's, I've got an, a slow system. It does, it's faster than no. snail mail. Faster than snail mail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. It's really yeah. funny when, when you have a friend that brings his laptop to your house and you're in separate rooms and it take, because we're trying to, you know, move something from one computer to the other and it takes 15 minutes you have to go get a cup of tea so that your email can... <laughs> yeah that's, I'm why trying... I that's why i didn't see anything when i first sent it because i knew it would probably take a while and by the way hi hannah <laughs> oh hannah i sent you several messages and got no response oh now you're in trouble hannah <laughs> yes Oh, and we can't hear you. You're muted. Hannah, you're muted. We can't hear you. Huh. Maybe my system is more slower than yours, Yolanda. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a long time ago? Mm. Oh, I, oh, no, I didn't send you an email, Hannah. I don't know. Oh, I, I was asking I Bobby. Oh. If it was a long time ago, you said, <laughs> Bob? Yes. Was it a long time ago you sent me mail? Well, I was doing the message thing on, on, on uh, uh, Zoom. I actually was able to do the chat thing and send you a message, but I got no response. Oh, I didn't see it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, it should still be there. If not, I'll talk to you. Okay. I, what What I'm interested in, okay, is if you've been following Riverboat, which I don't think you have, but that's okay. Uh, you probably noticed, if you did, that I'm having a lot of female callers do a female version of the song, as well as a male caller. Yes, I, I've seen that. Yeah, it's working out very well for me. And the last time I checked, you were female. So what? <laughs> what I want? <laughs> what I what I want to work out with you is: Will you? Uh, do you want to put some female vocals on some of my songs? Well, uh, the problem is that my uh, my pitch is closer to a male than a female. <laughs> Yes, that would be oh, great. okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Sorry about that. She has a <laughs> she she has a very lovely voice. I heard it just recently. It's gorgeous, oh. gorgeous. Oh Thank yes. You. And what Thank she's you. done for me has been phenomenal because of my 
I don't know how you would call it, Mel would say, a different approach. I want to do different things with my song. Like I recorded the song Silent Night in eight languages. Oh, oh so if, if, if you're Spanish, you can download the Spanish version or the French version or whatever. And I'm very much into that. And Hannah has been my superstar. She has recorded stuff for me in Polish, in in Swedish, in German, and uh, Polish, Swedish, and German, and yeah. some other language. I know that that she does, and I love her for it because I just I'm I'm reaching more people. I think, and you you would think that nobody does French. Well, there's three callers in France who call and sing in French. Yep. And they, they, they will buy these songs just because now they, they have somebody representing them. And my goal has been to reach as many people with as many languages, uh, both sexes now. I'm really working on getting uh, two different versions out, a male and a female vocal. And... That's not enough with for female vocals because, like Hannah says, she sings in the her her voice is in the male range. Yeah, it's like mine. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. that's okay, Hannah. If you want to do a female version, I I I will put you on a song and make it available if you feel that you can do a real good job with the song. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, sweetheart. <laughs> yes. I thought, oh, I wish, I thought, I wish you called closer to my home. So it was like, oh, we need to keep Zoom going forever. Like that I could actually hear some of these callers. I, I never uh -huh. would have heard you before. You know, we live way too far away. Yeah. yeah. So it, but, this is perfect. Yeah, you get to know a lot of more people this way. Yes. This has been fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. If Mel, let's put it like if, this: I didn't even know who Tony Oxidine was. Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now, now he actually knows who I am because of the the classes that I've been going to, right? Oh, okay. The, the newbie lady that talks too much. <laughs> no, you don't. No, when, you don't. Once, once the meeting is almost over and there's hardly anybody left, right? I do better yeah. in smaller groups than larger groups. So <laughs> if I'm if I'm going to say something that's really dingling, I'd rather do it in a small group than in a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm not oh, half as so shy funny. as I used to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've had fun after this going one on one with a with a Zoom chat. I really like that. Mm -hmm. I could kick myself for losing it. The I knew it was somewhere in the house. I'm just I'm trying to rearrange my house because you know for some reason when you start doing choreography in theory, it just sort of mushrooms. Like <laughs> I started with one or two binders. I think I have like twenty now. You know, so now I'm trying to develop a system where I can actually find it that it becomes a library. <sighs> so. Because a lot of this stuff was too far over my head, but I took notes anyway, that hopefully by the time that I got further along that I could refer back to it. <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know if you guys can still hear me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's really interesting to be at the very bottom of the class. It's not what I'm used to. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to being able to do a lot of prep and being prepared and there's no way that I can be prepared for this stuff there's way too much out there oh. how, Hannah how long have you been calling um, let me see I started in 97 okay and how often do you call well, uh, for the last year, not so often. Well, yeah. Hey. Well, we need, to get you on, we need to get you on Zoom. 
<laughs> uh, otherwise, I've been I'm calling about twice a week. Okay, and what what level? Um, I'm learning to call C1 right now, but I call basic regular regular basis. Now I call more A1, A2, and I have beginner class. But I have uh, given it away to Lars. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to practice. Okay. Yeah. And how long has have you been calling? I I have been doing singing calls since about 2016. About mm. once a month. Once a month. One 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 singing caller. Hopefully two, depending on how much time there was. So I just started doing patter before covid oh. and and so i am so new at this <laughs> yes. you are what i refer to a baby caller yes i think i wasn't yes. sure if it was you or somebody else has called me that <laughs> <It was> like... <laughs> so in the beginning i really kept my mouth shut a lot yeah you know so i mean i would never have dared open my mouth to bob especially once i realized that he owned river boat and stuff um now i'm getting to the point where you know get to know me of who i am <laughs> and i and i talk <laughs> it's probably That's one good. of the reasons i went into calling right yeah I'm, I'm much more i am much more comfortable talking by, behind the mic to 100 people than i am in a group of people having to talk one-on-one -on -one. like i will huh. talk in smaller groups behind the mic i have no problem Give me, give me a large floor. The largest floor I've done is 22 squares. It was amazing. Wow. <laughs> it was like, yes, you know, the more people, the better. Right. And, and once I get, once the music comes on, I, I, I usually don't quote me on this because Julie said that she wants to go me to go behind the mic. And if you are there, just watch, I'm going to mess up. But normally if I'm behind the mic, I get comfortable. I forget about, you know, I'm more nervous before I go on mic than once I'm on mic. Uh -huh. So I, um, they want it. I've done several provincials. So it's, yeah. And, and one time I was, um, I, I thought I was all done and I was going to go to caller school and all my equipment was in somebody's car because I'd help somebody else move. And one of the callers, corners, I was dancing. And one of the corners said, I, I didn't get to hear you because I had done the Friday one. And he says, oh, it's too bad. Are you still on the schedule? I said, no, but, and he turned around and he went and arranged for me to be on mic, <laughs> like over 20 squares. I didn't have any of my own equipment, any of my own stuff. And one of the other people loaned me their equipment. And I got... 20 odd squares and I'm halfway down the call and I realize the figure is different than mine and I guess I just had enough adrenaline kick in and I remembered the whole figure that I normally did and I did it totally by memory and I was scared to death I would make a mistake because that's the largest crowd that I had done and really I don't remember recommend a newbie caller doing that in front of and of course, there was all these callers, like 30% were like callers or caller wives or husband. And here I've got the mic and I have absolutely nothing in front of me <laughs> to fall back on. Hopefully it doesn't happen too often, but it's, it was when it, when it worked, it was really neat. <laughs> yeah. It builds up, uh, um, mm. your, uh self-esteem well i i didn't panic that was the main thing i didn't panic yeah. but i i That's normally cool. prefer to have stuff in front of me that i can read off of <laughs> but yeah, night, i never night. so how many yeah. squares how many squares do you normally have normally i have like two to four yeah, yeah we we don't have so many we have uh, one and or two squares okay yeah it, it depends if some of the people from the surrounding area come or not, you know, depends on the weather yeah. and things like that. Yeah. 
but yeah, the, the provincials are once a year. So that's the, that's the, when I get the chance, right? Yeah. Yeah. More. The first, the first time I was terrified, you know, I thought, there's no way, there's no way you're going to get me up there. Right. And they said, well, you only have to do the singing call. And one of the other callers did my patter inside his patter, like before me, that's how they got around it. And I was such a new, new caller that I didn't need even realize that they were doing that in the patter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, of course, it's I really, not so when I, when I started, I literally thought all you did was read the lyrics that came with the 45 because I started with 45s, right? I now use the laptop, but it, uh, I literally thought that was all there was to square dance calling is that you just sang. <laughs> yeah. Well, I now know different. <laughs> no, the longer I'm in these classes, the more I know that I still need to learn. Right. Yeah. So, true. Yeah. And if, if, and if somebody makes it look easy, it's because they've done a lot of work to get to that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're right about that. Yeah. The easier it looks, the more work they have put into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, talk, I talked to Julie and Walt for a couple of minutes after one of the sessions, and they definitely work at it. <laughs> yeah. So what about you, John? How long have you been calling? Uh, I started in 77 in Toowoomba in Queensland, Australia. Wow. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, largest, largest amount of, how, largest amount of squares. Uh, about, um, about a hundred, I think, at a national convention here in Australia. Yeah, well, from about 88 to 98, I was calling nine times a week, full-time okay. caller. How many times? Nine times? Nine times a week, yeah. I had groups from basic right through to uh, plus dance by definition. That's amazing. <laughs> and that was just square dancing. Uh, I also had two line dance classes and two round dance classes. Okay. Did you have a mentor helping you in the beginning? Yes, that's that's a really good question. Yeah, originally I started in Toowoomba. I started calling in May 77 in Toowoomba. And in November, I was one of eight callers from that club in an amateur callers contest. Oh. Um, the, the caller up there was the late um, Bill McCarty. Um, he taught me to call. And then when I moved to Brisbane, I had um, Eric Wendell, who was well known in Australia and I believe throughout some of the world as Mr. Hoedown. He was a very good uh, choreographer. Okay. I'm, go I'm going to ask you how you started, John. And oh, I was just going to say, I was going to ask Mike how he started. And, and you, I, I like finding out how, how people decided to start calling. Well, I was told to get up and call because the Bill McCarty, who was teaching us, he was an Australian ballroom champion and he knew me from ballroom previously back in the 60s. And um, he, the second night I was there, he handed me a record and said, listen to this and have a go at calling it. So within three weeks, I was up on the stage calling. <laughs> okay. How about you, Hannah? Well, I was kicked up on the stage by our club caller. Oh, um, apparently, we needed callers in the club. And uh, I'm, I wasn't keen on it at all from the beginning. I was very shy. And everything that came out from my mouth sounded like a question. <laughs> and that's not good for a caller. <laughs> well, you, you've improved since then. <laughs> <laughs> well, after so many years, <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah, yeah but uh, it took me a long time because I didn't have a mentor, so I tried to do it by myself, but I haven't been dancing so long. I started dancing uh, two years earlier, so it was really difficult for me. And I got many bad habits at the beginning. 
yet to meet a caller that hasn't. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Mel? When did you start? Um, <clears throat> the 1981 in Lahr, Germany. Um, I was dancing with the Schwarzwald founders. Our club caller was Kim Lindner, uh, Marv Lindner's son. He was in the American Army. He was posted in Karlsruhe. And uh, I was in Lahr. And uh, he eventually got sent back stateside. We didn't have a caller. We had a good teacher, Peter King, but he was by no means a square dance caller and he knew it and uh, we needed a caller. So I uh, sort of convinced the army to say, right, this is a Canadian German square dance club. It's part of a social thing. We need some equipment. We need some records. We need some money. Um, our club president was the sergeant major in charge of military intelligence for all of Europe, the NATO forces over there. So he was our vice president. I became the treasurer and between the two of us, we sort of got the military to buy us a new Hilton and the Yak Stacks and about 200 different records. And I started learning to call. And Kim, who was still up in Karlsruhe, uh, he came back and it was him, Bob Moffat, um, uh, Dietmar Creek was our, our, our cure. Um, who else did we have there? Kim Hool. I don't know if Kim's still around anywhere. Um, let's put it this way. Tom Kafka was just a new young kid just in his teens starting out to become a caller and, and people like that at that particular time. So that's, that's where I started. And, it, you know, self-taught with a little bit of help. And there was lots of guys like Bob Moffat, Al Stevens, and, you know, um, Jim Harrington was in Karlsruhe as well and, and a number of others and, you know, very, very supportive. And I was lucky. I had the music paid for, the machine paid for, the equipment paid for, <laughs> for me to learn. I had a budget to operate on and I had uh, uh, three, three full squares of really good solid dancers that were willing to be my living checkers that gave feedback as to what was comfortable, what was not comfortable, what sounded good and what didn't sound good. So I was truly lucky in that aspect. And, and what was the average age of the dancer? Our youngest dancer was six years old. Our oldest dancer was 96 years old. Okay, so the average one. Average age, um, well, it was a military German, and, and so our military members ranged between 20 and 40. Um, and then the local community was, as I said, between six and 96. You had a nice, you had a nice uh, squares to practice with to begin with. Yep. And our 96 year old dancer was probably a much more hyper and faster dancer than some of the 20 year olds. Oh, <laughs> I, I have a, a 90 year old that dances and he's one of the few people that can keep up with me. <laughs> yeah. There's, a, there's this misnomer that once you hit 70 years old, you have to turn the music down to about 24 instead of 33 or 45 or, or you know, it's not true. Oh. Well, I, uh, I've if, noticed if, that if you, if you teach them to move to the music and walk to the music, all they do is take shorter steps, but they move and it's a lot more comfortable for them. Sure. <laughs> Where it becomes uncomfortable is making them shuffle at, you know, 90 beats a minute and trying to call a record at 90 beats a minute instead of 124 beats a minute or something like that. And it just, it just ruins the dance form. Mm -hmm. The only anyway, thing is I have, I, I have one or two dancers in my regular weekly uh, mainstream class that um, are starting to get Alzheimer's. So they, they mm -hmm. can do, still do it by rote, but if, if, but they need processing time, right? Oh, I don't know. I had a I had a dancer at, uh, Okay, I can't hear you. Bob. One of my clubs who got Alzheimer's and you can bring him to the Oh, am I muted? I don't know what's going on. No. My just... computer quit on me a little bit ago. <laughs> hitting a time lag stall and then a mass dump. What it's yeah. doing, it's hitting a time lag and then it's bursting to catch up with you, kind of like a, a video you, you, program on the time um, lag. Bob, do you have Ethernet at all? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Because usually that takes care of it. I don't know what's going on. 
<laughs> Macintosh. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta oh, you go like... to Windows. You gotta go to Windows. <laughs> it, ma it makes no difference. It's, it's the service provider and what's going on in different yeah. areas. No, that's All sorts of things can happen. I always laugh when they say, oh, you can get a fiber optic cable right to the node and all this other kind of stuff, which is really great. And yeah, it's fast. You can, you can get a computer that'll, you know, it's got one terabyte download speed, which is great. When that was coming out and it was expensive, you can pay more for it. But the reality was, is all of the websites and all the service providers and everything else, didn't matter how fast you could receive, they all still went out at 126 bits. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, it only goes out that fast. It doesn't matter how fast you can take it in. It's still only come to you at the same speed as somebody that's on flying in on the hardware. Yeah, Yolanda, that's why your uh, why your email is slow. It's not because your computer is slow. Um, yes. It's because your service providers. If you had a fast computer, it would still be slow because that's got to be your service provider. Yeah, uh, for, I know. For, tra for transferring files, that 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 might matter if your computer was slow. To some Are you on Rogers or Bell? Me? Yeah. I'm on Telus. Oh, Telus. Okay. Yeah. Tell us what? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, we thought it was sort of funny, you know, but it, it uh, there was a real irony about the fact that it took that long. Now we've just accepted the fact that that's, that's how my provider works and we work around it. Right. But the, the other thing is that uh, in your mail program, there might be uh, a thing that you can adjust that says uh, uh, stuff like how often to go and check for mail. Um, because it might only wake up every 10 or 15 minutes to bother checking, and that would make it seem like it took 15 minutes to get there, but really it was just sitting there waiting all the time. Okay. Well, I'll write that down. I'm not that computer literate, so I, I talk to people and, and learn. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you go into the settings. Hey, I know more than I did a couple of months ago. <laughs> um, I couldn't even do the chat, let alone save it. So, um, so settings, can you say I, that again, Chris? I'm going to write it down. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what they would call it in your program. And they okay. it also might be that particular setting might be something that is, um, uh, it might be exposed or it might be a little bit buried in there because it's something that they figure you don't want to adjust all the time. But you know what you can do is sure. whenever you think you're supposed to, uh, have gotten an email, there's mm -hmm. got to be a button somewhere on some menu that says, go check for mail right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I use, uh -huh. uh, I use Thunderbird, which is a, a mail program that runs on everything. It runs on, you know, Windows and Mac and Linux and everything. Yeah, well, the thing is, um, TELUS is just going to upgrade to a, a Gmail format. I just got a notice actually one or two days ago that I need to um, spend some time doing that. But because I was supposed to Zoom call, uh, I figure I'm not changing anything until after I've done my Zoom session. Zoom um, doesn't affect your email. Well, it will if something freezes on my computer. Yeah, one disaster at a time is always a good policy. Yeah, you know, I've, I've finally figured out how to change from my old laptop that had that wonderful buzzy sound, remember, mm. to, the, to this one. So, and then I had to figure out how to get all the, how to get it connected up to my turntable. And my turntable is my speaker system, my MA something or other. And I have an external sound card, which is a Roland an old Roland machine that John had sitting around the house. So it's at least 10 years old, but we've got it all set up and we couldn't figure out why I had to raise my voice like crazy in order to call. And I had to crank up the music. So here I'm putting cotton in my ear so that they could hear me. And it turned, and I asked one of the guys who had a Hilton for 20 odd years, you know, and he said, no, no, only try, you know, turn this one button for their, for your mic. Well, it turns out in the middle of the turntable, there's something called a monitor that you have to also turn the voice up. 
Oh. So I was and, ha and having trouble hearing because the cotton ball wasn't working that well. <laughs> so I am just shouting, trying to, to call. But this is, but we. I finally got frustrated and started turning some of the knobs myself. And uh, so I went into to go to my my Zoom session. And two of the other callers, one of the other callers had had trouble with his laptop. And he says, he said, well, we can now understand your frustration of, of it taking so long because this took like six weeks to figure out. Right. And so they said, at the end of the session, we will work on it. And I actually fixed it myself. It was real. It was a real ka moment, you know, <laughs> and I could actually call without yelling. Somebody ought to make a uh, record a patter record called uh, Cotton Ball Express. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Mark. Hi, Mark. Yeah. yeah, we're all done. It's just general chit chat. If that's you still recording. Yeah. Yeah, that's me still recording. I just got back in here. Okay. And I, I could probably doing? shut my recording off, but every time I do that, then somebody just 